folks want to chit chat, you're welcome to still upstairs. Item is to elect a chair. Step up. Uh, I would make a motion to elect Trini Bessard to chair. Uh, I would second that. Any other takers? <laughs> <laughs> You've got the drill down. You're looking down already. Yeah. No eye contact. <laughs> <laughs> you have experience. Okay. Yeah. Hearing none. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Next, we have election of a vice chair. Mm. Michael's not here, and he was doing a great job with that, so. And he didn't say he wouldn't do it again. Sounds like a shoo-in. <laughs> <Your> motion. <laughs> second. Here you go. <laughs> Motion and a second for Mike as vice chair. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Next, we have uh, election of a clerk. This is mostly taking minutes, getting them turned around within the time the public meeting laws. I'm terrible at that. <laughs> <laughs> I have some skills, that is not oh, one of them. Oh, you get some skills? But no, 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 that is not one of them. <laughs> oh, okay. I do. I, Matt's going to take that. Okay. So I'll nominate Matt. I'll second that. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Just wanted to reconfirm for the vice chair. I know it's uh, uh, my children brain, but uh, the motion and the second is that? This tag team by Harry and Matt. Harry and Matt. <laughs> I'm sure I have a hit list for mm. Mm. Should have gone to Essex earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Next on the agenda is public comment. This is for anything that's not currently on our agenda. My name is Brooke Dingleteen. I'm a Randolph president. Um, I wanted to uh, make a comment about an issue that came up that kind of delayed town meeting yesterday. Um, Tom Hardy asked to be heard before the meeting convened, and he basically indicated that there had been a select board meeting the night before, on Monday night. And he was demanding some answers about what took place in executive session because he was aware that Mr. Ward had um, brought up an issue and uh, talked some about that and wanted an explanation, asked Mr. Ward for an explanation. Uh, accused the select board of, or Mr. Ward of convening an illegal executive session and then talked about the contents of what happened within that executive session. So I tried to get, be recognized uh, by the moderator to respond to this comment or issue that uh, Mr. Hardy had raised because I was extremely concerned that a member of the public would come into town meeting and talk about what he has heard took place in executive session. Uh, we understood from Mr. Ward that it was duly noticed. Executive session was entered for the purposes of discussing an employee issue, uh, and there was nothing inappropriate. No other select board members spoke up and disputed what Mr. Ward said. So um, I didn't get recognized at that time, but at the very end of the meeting, when other business was allowed to, uh, to be brought before the meeting, I decided that I needed to say something because it was very troubling to me that someone would come in 
to any meeting and suggests that the confidentiality of the executive session of the select board had been breached and that information had been given to people outside of the select board executive session membership. I talked a little bit about the need for transparency in terms of our elected officials and how important that is in terms of the ability of the public to have confidence in our elected officials that they are fulfilling their oaths of office. And one of those um, issues in terms of fulfilling your oath of office is to respect the sanctity of executive session confidentiality. No one in that room, whether they're a board member or someone invited into that room, has the right to breach that confidentiality. There are important reasons why executive session happens, and there are some very narrow reasons why any public board can meet in executive session without the public being present. If this was, as Mr. Ward suggested, and as the silence of the other board members indicated, that this was a duly enacted agenda, it was properly noticed, and there was an executive session for appropriate reasons, then there was nothing wrong with that, and that should have stayed private and confidential. There are important reasons of confidentiality for the employee, for example. Um, when you talk about negotiating contracts, uh, litigation, uh, mediation, there are reasons why premature public knowledge of information would compromise the ability of the board to, uh, you know, in a, in a litigation. If the other side knows what you're going to do ahead of time, that's a problem. So I would ask that this board um, be mindful of the obligation and the oath that you have taken in terms of not sharing private information that is supposed to be confidential with anyone outside of the executive session. And particularly for reasons that appear at least I don't know whether it was intentional or not, but appears to be for purposes of manipulating an election. I think it was totally improper for um, this to have happened, and I also think it's totally improper that it was brought forward in the accusatory way that it was. Now, I will also say that I am a friend to Mr. Hardy. I have great respect for him, and I am not suggesting Mr. Hardy did anything wrong. And to the extent that anyone yesterday thought that I was suggesting Mr. Hardy had in any way done anything wrong, that is absolutely false. The issue for me was the people in executive session, the elected officials and anyone they invite into that forum, those are the people who are bound by confidentiality. <coughs> so, so there's no mistake. I don't believe Mr. Hardy did anything wrong in hearing information that he was told about what took place in this executive session. My concern is, why was he told this information and by whom? Any other topics? And then we'll move to approval of the agenda. Mm -hmm. I, before the board takes up uh, item number four, I'd like to ask the board consider amending item E, which is liquor license renewal. We had one item come in uh, after the uh, agenda had been set. And if the board were to amend it, we could include it in this in this meeting. Uh, it is a liquor license renewal for Sedexo, Vermont. Good. Okay, the motion to approve the agenda. Was that a motion or are you looking for a motion? Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I move to approve the agenda. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.
approve the consent calendar. Mm -hmm. Second. Model Communities Program. Uh, if folks um, haven't heard, we're coming to Randolph with this program. We, um, uh, with, uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, under the leadership of, uh, of Gary Durr and a great uh, team of folks, and with the support of the Select Board, uh, Randolph applied to participate in the Model Communities Program as, and was selected as one of the two communities we will be working in uh, for 2018. You have a busy agenda tonight, so I don't want to take a ton of your time. My intention in being here is really, uh, A, to connect uh, uh, a face with a name. Uh, as I begin my work here in Randolph, I think um, there is actually nothing I like more than having my phone ring and having it be somebody from here in Randolph who has questions about the model communities process and what's about uh, sort of what that looks like and how to get involved in that process. It's that kind of uh, interest that um, is actually essential as we uh, as we try to build a, a, a successful program. So um, uh, mostly, I want to sort of. Uh, be sure that folks know I am uh, available and really welcome uh, questions and feedback as we embark on this process. And then quickly I want to give you an overview of what this process is going to look like so that folks have a sense of how to get involved and what, uh, and what this process is all about. Uh, I'm going to do that quickly though and then I'll field any, any, any questions you've got and then welcome any follow-up from folks either here or, uh, or elsewhere. I will, uh, I will acknowledge that I'm probably going to get on the road soon, soon after my presentation as the snow's, uh, snow's already started out there and I'm heading, heading back to my field. What did we see in the email that just came out? It's going to have to be horrible, horrible weather for tomorrow night <laughs> to get canceled That's if you're right. worried now. <laughs> I know this is nothing compared to what we might see tomorrow. Right? So uh, I'm going to hand around. Uh, I've got some uh, diagrams. I've got six copies of that. There's more of these copies. I don't think I have enough for everybody, but feel free to um, hand those around. So um, here's, uh, here's how this, well, first of all, let me just describe a little bit about why, um, what we mean by the climate economy and what, what the underlying um, sort of mission of this program is. Uh, for Vermont Council on Rural Development, for about the last three years, we've been convening a statewide conversation around the climate economy. And, and really, the, the core thesis of this program is that uh, essentially no matter uh, where you fall on this question about climate change and how we are responding to it either as a community or a state, what we know at this point is that there is a global response to climate change. And that global response to climate change is uh, massive, and it means the massive deployment of economic resources as, as various uh, nations and states and communities look to respond to climate change. And while climate change poses a real threat to our, uh, to our economy, as we think about our ski industry and other things here in Vermont, we also uh, can think about where are there op economic opportunities as, as communities respond to climate change, or as homes and businesses respond to climate change. And the Model Communities Program is built upon the idea that, um, uh, that we will bring, bring a community together and um, and really, it's up to you here in Randolph to decide what the shape of this program is uh, for Randolph. As, as we say at VCRD again and again, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Reed, for uh, closing the doors there. Um, we, we don't know what's best for Randolph. Uh, you, you here know what's best for Randolph. We have a theme for this conversation around the climate economy. 
but uh, we don't have a specific agenda. What, what you will uh, have the opportunity to participate in over the next few months is a series of public meetings, uh, first one in April that will be a big kickoff event, uh, where we will, um, uh, it essentially is a big series of brainstorming sessions. Uh, stay tuned as we as we uh, nail down a date for that, but but that'll be in April. And then in May, uh, the community will come back together to identify some priorities that that you all want to focus on as part of this climate economy model communities process. And then finally in June, uh, another uh, large public meeting where where the task forces that will push those initiatives forward will meet for the first time and really develop action plans uh, that, um, that are part of this initiative. Uh, the other important component to this program is we have a core partnership with Efficiency Vermont and Green Mountain Power and, um, and other partners. And that is because part of this program is not just thinking about community initiatives, but also thinking about opportunities for homes and businesses. I know uh, that you all um, participated in Vital Communities Weatherize program a few years ago, uh, and the Solarize program. You also participated in Efficiency Vermont's Targeted Communities program. So actually, what we want to do with this Model Communities program is really build on the great work that you've done through those three programs. What are those opportunities for homeowners in this community, for renters in this community, Maybe it's about energy efficiency. Maybe it's insulation. Maybe it's about solar on a rooftop. Maybe it's something as simple as swapping out uh, LED light bulbs, right? What, the, the goal in this process is to make it as easy as possible for people to participate. And, and really, the fundamental uh, mission is uh, we, we really uh, believe firmly that this is also about making a more affordable community for people to live in and, and helping people stay in their homes and make sure those homes are, are, are sort of both healthy and affordable. The average Vermont uh, home spends about $5,000 a year on energy costs. That $5,000 is split actually, uh, you know, a quarter of those costs are on electricity, a quarter of those costs are heating, and then half of the costs on energy for the average home is on the transportation fees. Uh, for a lot of for a lot of budgets, that's a that's a pretty significant portion of a home of a household budget over a year. That five thousand dollars, and uh, we're eager to work with you all to think about where are there are opportunities uh, for folks to achieve savings. There. So. Um, I, uh, like I say, I don't want to take up a ton of your time tonight. Mostly my message to you is um, uh, I am available. I really welcome questions. I welcome feedback as we get started in this process. I've really enjoyed, as I've started to engage folks in the community, what comes through loud and clear uh, here in Randolph is uh, people really feel uh, an enormous love for this place, uh, and um, it's obvious to me why. I mean, you are blessed with uh, uh, sort of a, a wonderful town and amazing institutions for a town of this size. And um, that, in part, is why VCRB is really excited about partnering <coughs> with you on this program, is we think there is great opportunity when you think about the college, when you think about the hospital, when you think about the tech center, when you think about the Chandler, all of those institutions uh, along with uh, with the town and uh, and others, you know, Rasta, all of those folks in this community. If you all are pulling together in the same direction, there's some real potential there. So that's what we're uh, we're looking forward to helping facilitate. So. Excuse me, do you have a phone number? Sure. Uh, uh, it's not an issue. An email address is John J O N O H at vtrural dot org. And then the phone number is 802-225-6393. And you know, town manager certainly has contact information as well as just Gary and others. I have cards too, so I'm um, happy to hand those around. So. John? Yeah, so if my, my understanding, you, you talked a lot about efficiency and energy specifically related things, but yep. you're also 
prepared through this process to put a lot of other things on the table, really depending upon what people come up with, right? It's not Absolutely. merely that narrowly focused. It could be much broader and far-reaching than that. With, without a doubt. I mean, to give you an example, we worked uh, uh, with Middlebury and Powell last year, and both of those communities in different ways really are thinking about agriculture as another opportunity. Obviously, there's enormous connections between agriculture and the economy here in Randolph, and also agriculture and climate uh, in, in here. So that's an example of the kind of thing. Transportation is another, uh, another place, as I mentioned. And transportation is an interesting thing, because we all are responsible for our own transportation. But at the same time, there's really a community aspect uh, to transportation as well. And so thinking about what are some of those community opportunities around transportation, economic development, recreation, it really is up to, to, to the citizens of Randolph to decide what those other components of this program are going to be. All right. Hey, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'll see some of you uh, tomorrow night, and um, really look forward to working working with Karen Randall. Thank you. What's happening? Thank you. Uh, we're having a sort of a first smaller conversation tomorrow night of a planning committee that will sort of set the uh, sort of plan the kickoff event. The important thing to note about that first meeting is it doesn't really limit the opportunities of this program. It really just sort of works on the logistics. And, and 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 helps uh, helps with the planning piece. So, is that piece open to the public? You know, I have a little bit of a juggle there, which is what we find is about 25 people is the ideal yeah. for that meeting. And to be honest, I have 27 people coming to that. So, I that's part of what BCRD has learned in the facilitation <laughs> process is to try to keep that particular meeting uh, sort of at that size. Uh, at the same time, as I, I would emphasize, nothing that gets decided uh, at that first meeting really limits the opportunity of this program. It's, it's wide open, and it's that first public meeting in April where, where the full opportunities for brainstorming uh, will happen. So, Thank you. Yeah. Yep. I just recently tried to go through Efficiency Vermont to put a new boiler in my house. Yep. But I decided not to do it through Efficiency Vermont because I had to go with a certain company to put my boiler in. Mm -hmm. I had to have a certain boiler at a certain percentage rate. Yep. And so I got a couple of cost estimates, and it was between eight and ten thousand dollars for the boiler. Mm -hmm. Well, I took it upon myself to go to Webb and buy a boiler for twenty-two hundred, and then have a local plumber put it in. So it cost me about three thousand dollars for. 140,000 BTU boiler. Yep. But with Efficient Vermont, if I went through them to get a $250 rebase, it was going to cost me between eight and ten thousand dollars. So mm -hmm. I didn't see any. Well, that's you know that's good that's feedback. Good. And the beauty of this program is we're going to have folks, folks from Efficiency Vermont <coughs> here and answering those kind of questions. Is uh, sometimes uh, what they do is provide some upstream incentives for particular more efficient boilers. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I would really have to let them answer sort of uh, what their process looks well, like. Well, mine was 87%, and they said they wanted over 90. Over 90, yeah, right. So, yeah. So, so this is going to have a local planning com committee uh, of residents, or who is that comprised of, and who decides who gets on that committee? You know, I, um, the real decision making happens in the big public conversations. Right? And then what will happen is there will be some task forces uh, that when the community uh, decides on initiatives, the task forces will then convene to move those initiatives forward. And when I think about sort of a, maybe a planning committee that comes as a part of that, maybe it's the local chairs of those task forces that are coming together to sort of be coordinated about how this process is moving forward. The, the one piece that I've experienced as I've done, I've been doing this work for about a year for the VCRD, and in a way, it seems like a three-month process because we're going to have public meetings in April, May, and June that are sort of the big convenings that we do a lot of promotion for. But really, the real work of this process starts at that June meeting when you convene task forces and when people get around the table and say, how are we actually going to move this thing forward? 
and 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 that. Uh, so I would I would ask you all have the long view as you think about this, and be thinking about what are the things that I want to emerge from this process. Not only do I want them to happen for Randolph, but what are the things that I might be willing to actually sit around the table on a monthly basis to help move forward uh, for this community. We at VCRD will certainly be a, a partner in moving those things forward, but ultimately what we see again and again is uh, the success of something like this is really contingent on having strong local teams and local leadership that's, that's ready to push these things forward. Can I make a comment? Um, we aren't looking for this to be just a one or two year program. We look at these task forces to go on four or five years more and be very on, ongoing. So uh, this could be, well be very transformative to the community in a very positive way. And these folks, uh, Paul Costello, an organization has been in 60 towns around uh, Vermont over the last 10 or 15 years. Not so much focus on the climate economy uh, aspect, but they're really pros at what they do. They really are, will pull this together. I, I appreciate you hitting one of my, you know, what, what we see is with our community visit process that this process is based on, sometimes you plant a seed that's part of the community visit and it, a task force will meet and literally it'll be two or three years later and that task force will have done something that maybe even it, 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 at its origins it never conceived of. But, but these, these, these uh, task forces sometimes, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know if I'd say have a life of their own, but they have a staying power and a real ability uh, to get things done. But that's where, again, I say sometimes you have to have a long view about some of these things. Obviously, we feel some urgency about uh, moving ahead, but uh, ultimately, it's, um, that'll be up to you folks. Thank you. Thanks so much. Next on the agenda is the downtown designation program discussion. Thank you for inviting me to talk about the downtown program. I understand this is uh, and what I prepared for is an overview about what the downtown program is about, uh, something about what we've done here through the program and how it works and what the various roles in it are. So um, I have some packets for everyone that they can review. Uh, you can refer, refer to those later. There's some information in there about designated downtowns. There are only 24 in Vermont. Um, those are the 24 on the cover. The second page is a little bit of an overview of the program. The third is a map of our designated downtown. It's, a, it's an actual boundary within which certain perks apply. Uh, then there's a list of all the different benefits that the program offers within those areas and sometimes with outside of those areas. Anything from tax credits, which I'll go into a little more, uh, to Act 250 benefits uh, within the downtown and some access to other programs that are downtown focused. A little bit more about the tax credits and the transportation fund which is another perk of the program. And then I have a two-page document that describes a little more in terms of Randolph, what the program benefits have been. Um, for example, you know, the tax credits that have been awarded per town and um, some of the statistics that we've done over time um, around that. So those are just a little more in-depth relative to Randolph specifically and also some, you know, some of the um, uh, special or potential uh, benefits that come out of it. Also, uh, in the, the final page is uh, just an overview of, uh, at the bottom is um, something that Adolfo has asked us to pull together, which is, it's just a, a rough estimate of time involved staff, time volunteered, 
an estimated attendance at our events or people who have benefited from some of the publications. And then finally, at the top of the last page, just a little overview. Uh, RACBC is also a development <laughs> uh, corporation, and our properties um, are listed there. The, the top are properties that we own, manage, or have a, 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 a controlling interest in. Um, we contribute uh, over $234,000 each year to the tax revenues of the mm -hmm. town. And then the bottom is some other projects that we have developed but no longer own, and that contributes another 40,600 plus uh, dollars of cash. So that's just a little overview of our involvement. And as you can see, many of those are in the downtown. Most of them are in the downtown. So we have a vested interest in seeing that this downtown thrives. Um, so the downtown program is essentially a community revitalization program, and it helps preserve uh, the historic character enhance the future of uh, what they call like medium to large size historic downtowns in Vermont. And of course, medium to large for Vermont is a little different than medium to large for other places. Um, and Randolph's been in the program almost since its inception. It was started in 1999, and I think we got our first designation in 2000. Um, the program provides communities with these financial incentives as well as training technical assistance to support local efforts. So as much as John was saying about their program, this is designed to support local efforts. It's not designed necessarily to tell you what to do, but to encourage, um, for example, we are not alone in having a lot of fires in our downtown. A lot of Vermont towns have fires in their downtown, and one of the things that the tax credits specifically target is sprinkler systems or elevators for three and four story buildings that people can no longer use for commercial purposes or even for residential purposes because of the fire codes these days and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's a way to not only support economic development, to, but to support safety and the viability of the buildings over time. Um, so the um, municipalities receive, apply for and receive the designation, but the program uh, requires a local nonprofit organization to actually be the organization that maintains the program compliance and keeps it in good standing. And this is designed to be a collaborative process uh, between the organization, the town, and also other organizations and individuals in town who all participate together, um, hopefully through you know, the development of larger goals. Again, much as in the climate economy, you want to look forward. You got to think big, but you got to work sometimes in, in a more you know, short-term basis to get where you're going. And it's the same kind of approach. It's based on the Main Street approach, which is um, a sort of a proven uh, approach that was developed by um, the National Trust for Historic Preservation a long time ago. And, and basically, you're looking long term, but you're uh, trying to find inexpensive short term ways to bring people to the downtown and to bring people together in action. Uh, and then the state then provides technical assistance, training, networking, some other things that can help move things along. And so, just a little, doing a little show and tell here. So, I developed some pages that will illustrate some of the things that I'm going to talk about that we've done in the downtown. And um, you can look at those as we go. Uh, so the first is, uh, you know, flames are kind of something we get used to around right here. In 2010, fire destroyed um, the building that Chef's Deli is now in. It actually, we were luckier than with the Belmain, Ben Franklin building because the structure was so intact that the inside was completely destroyed. And uh, the insurance wouldn't cover the cost of rebuilding. And uh, luckily, if there was luck in that, the luck was that it happened, I think, in March or April, and the tax credit ran was in July. So we were able to work with them to within a, a really a few months to get them a $100,000 tax credit award, which enabled them to redo the building to maintain the historic facade. You really would not know, because of that money, that that building had seen any change, except that there's less coatings of paint on the, on the exterior detail. Um, so, and I gotta say that this is one of the simplest money programs in the world because it's really a tax credit, but you don't have to be able to have a large tax hit yourself to take advantage of the credits because you can sell them to a bank, an insurance company, or any other taxpayer. 
Um, and so it's very easy to use. They're very expeditious about deciding. You don't wait a half a year to find out about the tax credits. And so, so more recently, uh, we've helped uh, other, some other local businesses get these. One name, Tap and Grill, uh, a couple of buildings in the foundry complex, and Catamount Solar are rec more recent uh, awardees of tax credits. And total, we've received as a community almost 500000 over time. So it's a, and that's leveraged, obviously, in the case of, for example, that building, the, the tax credits, the $100,000 in tax credits enabled an $800,000 project to happen, so we <coughs> leverage private funding. Uh, the other big um, benefit is downtown transportation grants. And these are um, Department of Transportation funds, uh, several hundred thousand dollars a year, usually it fluctuates a little bit. And these funds are only accessible by designated downtowns. So they're competitive, but they're competitive within a much smaller group of towns. And we've received you know, several over the years, I actually don't know all of them, but I know of in the recent past at least three or four hundred thousand dollars in transportation grants. And those have been, and I think we're planning to apply again this month, if all goes well. Um, and that goes for sidewalks, paving, lighting, signage, all those things, the sort of infrastructural things that support business and, and civic life in a downtown. So really important. Again, pretty easy. It's a grant. You have to go through the grant process. Um, but it really helps you leverage those town dollars that are going to that kind of work. Um, and they also want to help with signage, like let people know where your downtown is. And so um, things like the kiosk and signage, um, the, the welcome to Randolph signs, those are examples of the kinds of things they will do as well. Other benefits, again, on that list, uh, I'll just highlight a couple. Preferred grant status. Virtually every grant in the state and many federal grants will prioritize downtown designated areas or downtown areas. Even if you're not in the area, for example, our, our waste uh, our wastewater plant receives preferential grant status because, in part, of it serving a designated downtown. So there are those ancillary benefits that are then really impossible to see how much we get from them, but we get regularly sort of a preferential status. Uh, the state uh, agencies that cooperate in this are very helpful when we need them. So technical assistance, and again, there are generating things like Act 250 waivers and things like that. They're going to help development in the downtown be easier. Uh, and as I said, it also sort of uh, incentivizes short-term things that enliven the downtown. So things like recently our mini maker fair. Uh, we had become concerned that our kids weren't getting enough exposure to the kinds of tech skills that really are the career of the future. And these maker spaces that are developing all over the place, most universities have them now, uh, are great. But to get there, often you have to take smaller steps, like a, a fair is often a sort of a gateway to a space. And um, so we, we contracted with the generator, the uh, developer of the Burlington Generator and the Champlain Maker Fair. And he helped us start one here. Uh, we started it in 2016. In our second year, I think we may be, I'm not sure. I know we're the smallest town in Vermont. We may be the smallest town in the country to hold a maker fair. They're usually in larger cities. And this year, uh, this past year, we were the largest um, maker fair in Vermont, set, second to Champlain. So it, it's grown. It's wonderful. We get a lot of local business involvement. And, and it's uh, terrifically fun to see kids um, doing some hands-on things and seeing what's possible. It's, kind of looks like magic sometimes. Um, and so that works really well. We also host things like, um, like Home Town. We host Safe and Seen Halloween. We work with the town and with the chamber. Tree lighting events with the town. Um, we do our annual meeting highlighting some of our work and that's open to the public. And then last year we hosted the White River Valley Career and Job Fair as well. Um, and so we try to find those things that will help, you know, bring vitality, but also bring skills. And then um, placemaking is a big initiative in the downtown world now. It's, it's an effort to really make public, public spaces more useful and fun, and often involving the community participation in the design or the production, the, the creation of the space. Um, and so Montpelier's little pocket park effort really inspired our work with um, 
And we have been working, as John mentioned, with Efficiency Vermont in their pilot targeted community program. And so um, we got this idea to bring Ward Joyce, who's the architect there, to help us design a pocket park locally and um, got some support from the town, from Efficiency Vermont, from um, LED Dynamics, kind of a lot of local businesses are supporting that effort and we hope to be able to kick that off this, um, kick the, the build off, finish the fundraising, kick off the community build this summer. Um, we do have some work still to do with the town to enable that to go forward, but we're, we're really, I hope, very close to being able to do that and to really bring a, one of the few sort of public spaces onto our downtown. And then uh, we try to involve youth in virtually everything we do. Last year, we worked with volunteers from RTCC, RUHS, VTC, GEMS, Rotary Interact, AmeriCorps, and other individual young people to find meaningful ways to, for them to get involved, including the downtown survey, for example. Not only did they help fill it out, um, but their classroom used it to do data analytics. Um, so that was a great opportunity. Uh, RCC administers a small business revolving loan fund, and we've helped several local businesses start, like Vermont Computing, Vermont Natural Sheepskins, and Freedom Foods uh, got loans from us in their startup or expanding businesses like Valley Bowl and Garner Woodworking. That's more recent. And um, we've also been able to use outside grant sources for technical assistance, um, such as, I think there's a blurb about uh, a, a technical assistance grant we got from USDA to help LED Dynamics and um, the farm stand, which became Chef's Market, when they were just beginning to want to do more with their publicity, so signage, logos, publicity materials, and that sort of helps them get to the next step there. Um, and then we match make businesses that are available or buildings that are available or businesses that are looking for a building. We try to keep track of what's available, what its amenities are. And so when we hear about somebody looking for something, as we recently did with an empty building in downtown, which we hope is gonna, is gonna gain some traction, we try to find the right match so people aren't, don't have to hunt too far. Um, and obviously in the coming year, we look forward to participating with the Climate Economy Program. Um, there's a picture in there of um, this zero energy modular home built in Vermont, which we're gonna be able to um, get a sort of mobile unit to be able to take other places, but also to, to just demonstrate here, um, which is a, a sort of a whole new home product. Um, so we estimate that in 2017, we contributed staff time of over 2,100 hours, volunteer time of over 1,000 hours, and produced events or promotion that reached pretty conservatively about 5,000 people around the downtown. Um, but it works best when we work together, and so we're really looking forward to finding ways, long-term and short-term ways, to improve civic life and economic well-being downtown. And um, to continue that work, so if there's any questions? And the town does support our work, has supported our work over time, um, and that is part of the expectation of the program, that the town gets involved in supporting the organization as well as uh, contributing um, in kind, you know, work and uh, collaborative efforts, and obviously goal setting, which is important to us. So, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And if we want to pass those around, I can pass this around the public as well. <laughs> different, different set of photos and the, 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 the same bunch. Of, no, no, that's yeah, a, okay. yeah, that's for you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Into your presentation, you said goal setting. When was the last time the town sat down with our ACDC to do goal setting? Well, you know, we applied, you have to reapply periodically for this program. So it used to be a few years, I think now it's every five years. The last time we did it was last year. Uh, well, and I'm a year off. I keep thinking it's 2017. In 2016, we had to apply for renewal. And at that time, we did look at, developed a work plan and did review it with the town at that time. But it's a little different. So what we haven't done for a long time, and really I would welcome uh, doing because I think it's extremely important, it's one thing to develop a task list. It's a completely other thing to develop 
a goal setting list. And when this program started, when we first um, got involved in the designation, uh, it was not too far after the fires, and this town had a pretty big wish list. I reviewed this recently when I did a presentation for uh, American Planning Association in Vermont, and it had, you know, this town had an impressive to-do list, and it was visionary, it was ambitious, and they're almost all done. And then, as things sort of got done, we stopped developing big wish lists. And, uh, and I think we need to do that again. Because um, those things, when you check off that list, and I don't have it memorized now, but uh, the skating rink, a new bridge, uh, renovate Chandler, uh, the, you know, our Salisbury Square project was a brownfield and a crime scene, renovate that. I mean, they were not small things. And, uh, and I think all but one that we had in the initial application got completed. Um, and so that's um, inspiring, I think. And, and I think we need to do that as well as sort of the, what are we gonna try to accomplish this year list. Um, and the thing about this program is that while the town applies and certainly we want to collaborate efforts, it's not, and it's not like an employee, employer, or, or contractor relationship. It's really a collaborative you know, sort of relationship under the statutory umbrella of this program. And, and it, in that way, it was designed to really take advantage of, of the, the strength of the town and maybe some of the more nimbleness of a, of a nonprofit organization to be able to do things that the town that maybe can't or can't do as quickly or doesn't have the staff time to do. So it could, you know, it has the potential to be a powerful uh, combination and then obviously you want as many other organizations and individuals involved as possible and businesses certainly. Um, but those big goals really, when you look at um, to list it, you know, we don't have that as a community, and I think that's one of the things that uh, it would be really helpful. A climate economy, same thing. You need some big goals to be able to see your way toward them, and we haven't done that in a long time. Maybe we can put you right in that list on the task. I think we'll be able to find them. Uh, but what, he's, uh, what he also said is true, Bethel University, or Bethel has, has adopted, I can't remember who, who coined it, but it's a wonderful word, um, that we are duocracies. Uh, you know, we, <laughs> we, we need to come up with big ideas, but we also need to be willing uh, to work on them, <laughs> because no one organization, no one person, uh, no one group can do this alone. So it's important that we have ideas and we're willing to work. <laughs> Thank you very much. I have a question. Can I let the board to ask for any questions from the board? For me, I'm all set. I think I'm good for now. <clears throat> now, I know that Salisbury Square is not underdeveloped, or is underdeveloped, and I see here you have a thing from, from Vermont Mod. Now, if I was to purchase one of these 40 by 13 foot glorified mobile homes <clears throat> that is energy efficient mm -hmm. and I put it over there at Salisbury Square or Randolph Place, I don't know what it's called now. How much would it cost me to move in? Do I have to buy the land? How much it costs me for a water sewer hookup? Yeah. Um, the lease or whatever it is, the whole nine yards. If I was to put one in there and my first day, how much would it cost me? Right, and, and the reason I can't answer that yet is because we're working on the designs with Vermont now. Um, Mr. Joy is right, the Vermont was started, uh, the company was started after Irene as a mobile home replacement concept. Um, so it looks like a box car, <laughs> it looks like a mobile home. Um, and it, that's why it was created, and it was created to be affordable and a, what they call zero energy module, meaning that it, it creates all the energy it uses. I understand that, but, but I don't know what the cost is. But, and so a model like that, a 70 by 14 model, would probably cost in the vicinity of 150, 160,000. And then there are incentives from Efficiency Vermont and others that brings it down to more like the $100,000 range. But we're working on um, something that 
is a little more design and a little more community friendly. We don't have the designs and we don't have the pricing in yet, but that is the goal, that they not look quite like uh, their, their original design. My dad's an engineer, so I understand this. Engineers are often not designers. The guy who runs Vermont is an engineer. <laughs> and he's, he's and it's, it, 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 as my dad would say, it works, doesn't it? But we're looking at um, ways to maybe step up the design a little bit. Can I just offer an unsolicited testimonial about the downtown designation program? Just, just a minute. Um, I was personally involved with the building that is now known as the Three Bean Cafe, but at the time it was a decrepit building that was right on the verge of being, should, should have been demolished. And thanks to the downtown designation and the state program and combined federal and state tax credits. There was enough incentive that I rehabilitated that and as a result, 12 to 15 years later, it remains as a viable downtown entity, well known to many and still on the historic register. And none of that would have happened without those tax credits. So. On these, on these mod things, which is sort of like a glorified trailer, so how does that enhance our, our community, the look of our community that we stuff a trailer park in the back of it? Yeah, when, as I was explaining before, Joe, maybe I wasn't clear. Um, so the initial design was designed to be a mobile home replacement product. So in those areas, particularly that got hit hard by Irene, when uh, and some of the trailers were old and not at all energy efficient and some of them really not habitable um, there was an effort by the state to make sure that the ones that could be replaced were replaced with high quality replacement units and that vermod was created around that by the engineer that used to work for uh, a modular home company and the difference between a Vermont and a modular home is essentially that it integrates all the energy features. And um, so it's got solar that basically powers the unit. Um, but it is not des that design, that particular design um, that you're looking at, and that is, a real, is the model that's going to be on a trailer that's going to roam the, the community so that people can see what it's like inside and how it works. But we're working with architects to take the idea and to make it look better. <laughs> to make it, because you can, it's just like a modular home. You can build pretty much anything you want with them, but you have to get, you know, the cost point is of concern to us. And so it's both trying to build something that looks good, that is the size that the market needs, and that is going to break the piggy bank, or that we can get subsidies from some of these agencies that are promoting um, zero energy things. Green Mountain Power is, has been donating or, or providing Tesla power walls for some of these units. So it's, it's a really, it's an innovative time, but they don't have a lot of more sort of what you'd consider a sort of a normal house design yet, and we're working on trying to make that happen, at least something that we feel uh, good about offering to the community. And we will test those with the community to see what people think. The reason I, I kind of ask is because, you know, up at the Red House Center at the Interchange District, if you will, you know, we have a design review committee, and it has to meet this, and it has to meet, you know, about everything you think of to, to fit in there, yet right here in the middle of our downtown and talking a downtown district of downtown yep. designation, we're talking historic preservation. In the middle of your downtown, which is basically where that is, we're essentially looking to put in a trailer park. And I'm just wondering how does that design review really happen and how does the, the public select board, planning commission, DRBs, whatever, whatever you will, get involved with how that's going to look. Yeah, well right now we don't have a historic district downtown. That's something I think we would support. Um, but as I said, we have no intention of putting a trailer park looking thing in that property. What we're working with is working with engineers who have worked with, uh, and, and architects who have worked with the Vermont model to now take it to its next phase, 
which is a more, um, and it's already happening, but uh, into a more mainstream application. <laughs> so will there be a public process? Yeah, yeah, we're gonna send those designs out to people because, because it's in our interest to, to test the market as well. We're gonna to need to test the market and say, hey, we think this design looks good, but do you think it looks good? Because um, somebody's gotta buy it. <laughs> so do you have a target market yet? I'm just curious yeah. who the target um, market is. I mean, is. the primary target market, in part because of the, um, you know, the state's goals, is 80 to, uh, 80 to 120 percent median income, mm -hmm. and um, and so it's average uh, income folks. So there will be some that might be more, um, but some that might be less, and um, it really depends on what kind of package we can put together. And you know, these kind of ideally, this kind of product would also be attractive to young people, to you know, people who don't want to like. I have all my life, you know, spend all your mm -hmm. waking extra hours fixing the old house. People want to go in, don't want a huge house, want a new house, don't want to have to think about it too much, and um, so people who come, you know, who may be attracted to work here want a new, you know, home within striking distance of a downtown. We don't have much built after, you know, like 1940 in mm -hmm. town. Um, and so it's a departure and it's a challenge because um, building prices are going up. Right. But, um, but we have this local company, uh, really it's, you know, he's done in Wilder, you know, Upper Valley. And uh, he's willing to work hard with us to see if he can find Come up a with a design, a market, a market thing that fits everybody that might be working in the community. So to answer Joe's questions, I think, you know, that is a concern. Mm -hmm. So, but we're eventually going to have to provide, you know, some form of conceptual artist rendering type stuff. I would imagine how the community is going to be built, something similar to what you did last time. Yeah, absolutely. And we want to get it out there early because we want to test it. We want to hear pe what people say before, you know, we invest anything in it because it's not going to be worth anything uh, if you can't sell them. Right. Okay. So the, the median income, right, on, on the last survey that was done was median family yeah. income in Randolph was 36000 or 38000 That That enabled the grant funding for the wastewater facility. And so you're building to that market the $36,000 a year family income? It depends on your... On your I, it depends on your pop value. The average income for a family of four, I think, is over sixty thousand dollars. I'm saying that that was that income survey at that, mm -hmm. at that at that time in Randolph. That was for your so, downtown, not for the whole community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Question. Yeah, well, uh, I just want to say one thing about it. My name's Roger Glutsky, and I'm on the board at RCDC, and I've had a chance to look at some of the preliminary designs. So I just wanted to add to what Julie's saying, that really the goal of the project is to do two things. One is to make sure that aesthetically it adds to the value of the downtown. So we've actually gone through a design process initially where we've looked at early designs that were not good enough, and they've been rejected. Um, with the sense that we need, we want something that the town will be proud of. So that's really a criteria in moving forward with the project. And the second is we wanted to attract new people to the town, uh, not just move people around the town. Um, and so if we come up with a design that's efficient, that uh, values the environment, um, is affordable, uh, we believe we can attract young family productive workers to the downtown. And we think that this is a project that will really help the town become, you know, revitalized. So um, I think really a value in going forward with this process is to get as much community support around the initiatives that have been started. And if they're not where we need to be, we want to make them better. Any comments on the Don't downtown we need designation? jobs for then people to come in? Yep. This topic is on the downtown designation program. Thanks, Julie. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have um, appointments to committees. Is there anybody in the audience here on committee appointments? We have two uh, prospective uh, candidates. We have Jessamyn West, and then we also have uh, Tom Ayers. Uh, Tom is seeking appointment to a vacant position with the Economic Development Council 
and Jessamine is seeking appointment to the Conservation Commission, which also has a current vacant uh, uh, position. abide by the, the application that I submitted. Uh, if there are any questions, um, I would simply just underscore that I have pretty significant background, including as an elected um, official in, in another municipality in economic development and community development initiatives, having chaired um, committees as a city councilor in Burlington and, and all of those areas, and also in the transportation, energy, and utilities sector. So I bring a fairly diverse perspective um, to the whole question of economic development. And as the now 11-month um, director of the Chandler Center for the Arts here in Randolph, I think I can bring a perspective of uh, the leader of a major economic driver in the community to the council as well. And so that's my interest in stepping up. Thank you. Yeah, and I just am interested in being on the Conservation Commission as sort of somebody who likes the outdoors of Randolph but isn't super sporty, although I will say I put my application in before the Conservation Commission was on the front page of the newspaper, but I am still <laughs> up for it. Um, and I just want to help with some of the communication that we do with the Conservation Commission, with the town, with partnerships with other organizations, and with um, sort of figuring out what to do with some of the upcoming changes that are going to make the Conservation Commission job slightly more complicated, and I'm interested in participating and continuing to serve. I've been a Justice of the Peace in town for six-ish years. I'm looking forward to being on a committee with regular meetings, and um, that's pretty much it. I just like the outdoors and want everybody to like the outdoors. Great. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Yeah. Next we have um, classification of Furnace Road. So let's see what this is all about. So um, uh, Governor Scott has an initiative that he's put in place to um, make improvements to uh, things that affect the lives of veterans and their families. And each of the agencies statewide needed to come up with some projects and initiatives. And Randolph just happens to have the Veterans Cemetery uh, on town road. 
class three road right now. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the items put forward by somebody that was on the committee to identify projects that transportation could participate in was the um, repaving of Furnace Road. So um, it was identified as a item of interest. And what they're asking us to do is to reclassify Furnace Road to be a class two highway. The state does not provide any grant funding for class three highways um, for this type of effort. And then um, they will fund the repaving of the road as long as we can get the spec out and have it bid by Memorial Day. And they will do from Route 66 down the entire distance, I believe, because um, the measurements we've gotten off <coughs> On, from online mm -hmm. is that it's only about another tenth or two tenths of a mile yeah. beyond the entrance. So um, what we need to do as a board, if we support this, is uh, vote to have Adolfo write a letter requesting the Secretary of Transportation to reclassify Furnace Road to a Class 2 highway. They have um, what they need to issue the grant to us to do this. Uh, it is an overlay similar to what you see what was done on Route 14 from the intersection 107 to uh, Williamstown line in the last couple of years. Um, we tried for a complete drainage mill overlay project. But, yeah. Just wanted to be baby. Yeah, yeah. Well, 125,000 versus 750. Yeah, no, I'm sure that was better. Repaving, but when we look at a uh, high use highway, uh, overlay lasts about five years, is the basically the time they give it. This one they believe will be closer to eight to ten, mm -hmm. um, but it would be 100% paid for by the state. So it will, it will give us a repaved town road at no cost to the thing. We just have to agree to change it to a class two highway, which um, actually increases what we get paid by the state in the mileage. So I thought that increased the mileage. Yeah. If we go to, it'll take this. I think it goes out to almost a mile and move it into class two out of class three to give us a higher payment for roadways. Sounds like an agreement. Any motion? Thank you. Right. So I've, well, first before, I just have a question. That's just, this, it does sound like a no-brainer. Yeah. Um, if, if, if this is the case and if we get more money from the state for class two roads, why aren't other roads class two? Is it, is it just a matter of they don't qualify for that kind of level of that, that particular classification? And if so, why would this qualify? It seems like it's not a terribly highly traveled road. Um, you're right. They they have to meet certain qualifications to get in. This one's going to have an exception made because it has a high traffic generator at the end of it that's owned by the state. Okay. There is a requirement that would prohibit. So the process, although the the towns are allowed, towns are allowed to make a motion to reclassify the road from class three to class two. Um, process has to be approved by the agency of transportation. So even if the town were to any town were to make this this vote and then pass it forward and make a request. The agency of transportation couldn't deny it. In this case, it would work out because we're working with them at the moment. Um, we also are able to do it because we, there's a limit of the number of miles that we have for class two classification. And so long as we remain at 25% or less of the number of class three miles that we have in the town, we're able to do this if the state allows us to make the, the transition. And we would remain under 25% of our total plus three room miles. I think they want to fix it. It's pretty so, much it's so, yeah, it sounds good. It's I pretty just... much an embarrassment to drive to that beautiful facility over there going down that road. Mm. And I think that seems to me that uh, we should allow them to make that repair. Is that a motion? I move. Can I ask a question first? Sure. Is the bid spec prepared entirely by the town? It has to follow the town's spec and bidding process. Okay, I didn't know if we would have to go out with an RFP and then that would those uh, services be covered under the 
funding as part of the um, 100%. Yeah, the, if we were, if we have to do anything special to do the job, it is covered in what the state will pay. Do you want the motion? Sure. Okay, so I would move that we upgrade the road to a class two based on the fact that the state is willing to reimburse or take on the cost of that project at 100%. And second that. second, all those in favor? Aye. <laughs> Next on the agenda, we have a liquor license renewal for Shaw's Cumberland Farm, Champlain Farms, Randolph Village Pizza, and early wheat at its civic level. Anybody have a comment with any of them? Is there any reason not to? Okay. Oh, what's the aesthetics? Oh, yeah, there's that. Mm -hmm. BTC. Oh, BTC. Any concerns? Mm -hmm. Any concerns? Mm -hmm. Any concerns? Mm -hmm. Your turn. I'll move we approve the liquor license renewals for Shaw's Cumberland Farm, Champlain. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Next we have the recreation area. <coughs> we have uh, Heidi Arias, our recreation director, here to uh, speak about this next agenda. Mm -hmm. um, the the resurfacing of the courts is on the capital projects um, with another maintenance, so we keep on our maintenance schedule. Uh, we will, our, course, our courts will not end up like BTCs, they're all payable. Um, so got the three bids and I'm recommending that uh, we go forward with uh, what did I do? The Vantage Tennis Courts because they um, they have more of a warranty on them, a three-year warranty on the seal, um, as well as uh, two new tennis nets um, that come with it, so that's also an expense. Um, but we will resurface it, they'll seal the cracks um, that include the basketball and the tennis courts and add to the windscreens that provide on the on the parking side where all the dust comes through as well as through the divide the basketball courts and the tennis courts. So all that is within budgets. I have a comment about the windscreen. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, I'm sorry. I hate something. And this is looking at a late May, early June. Yes, the so the sooner we go for the, the sooner they get us on the schedule. Um, tennis schedule starts June, um, and we're hoping to add the pickleball line, so we're going to add a pickleball league for adults, as well as providing some additional programming for kids. So it's an add-on. Lots of, lots of interest in pickleball. A lot of people are going to Mount Pillar rather than staying in our courts. So, looking forward to that. Yeah, sounds great. Yeah. Any questions? Does your recreation or summer recreation camp use these facilities? Yes, Is that we do. Of just want to point out to the board that Heidi's been really working hard with not only just the obtaining of the um, um, estimates, but also working with the community and the community groups that use these facilities. And so she's um, trying to get us the best price possible, but also making sure that whatever the town is able to get from these best prices is also what the community is asking for. So it's put in a lot of work into this project. Yeah, I work with the tennis committee, uh, the tennis folks that are pretty strong. They have 50 members that play in the year in the league. Um, so all, all the captains are involved and been um, working on this throughout the last couple of six months. So tell me a little bit about the pickleball. What's the, 
Is there a league? Is there a league here yet? No, nope. we're, we're going to develop them. We're, we're going to develop them. Great. Okay. Yes. Sounds good. Watchy's on the hopper, I think, so. Yes. <laughs> I'm, still <laughs> <crucified>. <laughs> I'm waiting for curling. I'm waiting for that. That's next year. That's next year. Curling? Yes. Great. So they use those little uh, vacuum cleaners to see the end of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's scandal. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. All righty. Um, they, I happen to live next to the tennis courts, and I have noticed for the last five years or so, basically, the nets are, and the windscreens are up, but then during the winter, they get a ton of abuse, and they're just like flying all over and flapping all over, and basically, they like are destroying themselves. Like yeah, themselves. so, so no one ever takes them down, though, in the fall, in like maybe October, November, when no one's out playing tennis, and then puts them back up, so they seem to last about half as long as they should, and I, I assume that they're much more expensive than one would imagine. It looks like just landscape material, but it's probably something that's more expensive than landscape material. But I'm just thinking if, oh, yeah, if no, you need to buy new ones, that maybe there's a way to get twice as much use out of it by taking them down during the winter. Oh, we will. Those okay. are um, but that's under Harbor, okay. and so under my watch, they will be. OK, because in the down. past, they just would stay up there. No, I totally watch watch and flap around more. It's so. going to be part of our okay. great, um, great. fall winterizing Super. schedule. Super. Yes, oh, another application issue is also lights. I know that's not on the list, but that those particular tennis lights often will be on with nobody out there just for kind of no reason. It's not, it, there's no kind of rhyme or reason to when that might happen. And a few years back I did call and no one seems to really be responsive or in control or could explain what makes them go on and what makes them go off. It doesn't seem to be as Was the, is the games when we have talked to the mm -hmm. captains that they are responsible mm -hmm. for turning them off? This when might be in the middle of December. They go on. They're on at three in the morning. Oh, or something. Okay. Well, that should be reported, and <laughs> okay. we will look into it. Okay. If that's okay. Probably just a malfunction okay. or something. I'll pay more attention. I, mean, I have called. Yeah. Them, no. That's a, okay. Please call me. Yeah. yeah. All right. I will. <laughs> Absolutely. So thanks. Thanks. How many different towns use that facility? Our facility. Um, well, our league is con is mainly of Randolph, Braintree, and Brookfield. That play, but I would um, I've contacted a part of a USTA league as well, and so we're looking to expand and offer some tournaments. Uh, I am a tournament director for USTA, and looking to expand. And our, those are really Randolph has two nice courts, so we want to keep them maintained and so are all these more. towns contributing to the resurfacing? No. Why not? Well, it, the majority is Randolph. There's probably I, can I know count there's of, teams from Bethel. No, we don't have teams from Bethel. The mm. league that I run is from Randolph. We might have one or two people from Book Frankie, <coughs> but we don't play. We play here and we play at DTC because we don't, we need a third and fourth court, and mm. that's really unplayable. So we All have right. to stay here. Can I make a comment about that? Sure. So we also have Little League Field that other members of the community from other places use, and so we don't think we're charging other towns for use of Little League Fields. So I'm not trying to short sight anybody, yes. but my remark is that we're one community here with multiple towns around us, and so we are that core community, and so we do share things back and forth. So when I played Little League years ago, we played in Royalton and Chelsea and Randolph, and so I think this is similar. Yes. Perhaps if they had corn operated lights and they would shut off on that. Yeah, corn operated lights or maybe better timers or something. I think that's an energy commission item. I think they can help you fix that one. Just asking. Entertain a motion for this? It's your turn, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'll make a motion we uh, approve the repair to the park recreation area, including the research. I'll second it. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Heidi. Next, we have old business. The road is revision to land development. Please get voted. Yes, we uh, were not able to have our, the request for the last meeting was to have our, uh, <coughs> Uh, Marty to be here today, but just due to the weather, she asked if we could postpone this one item for uh, for one more month until next week. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Then we go on to Randolph Center solar proposal. 
This is an item that was brought to the town in the past, and the town was asked to consider the project. Um, it had laid dormant for quite some time, and there have been some recent changes to the project. The subsidiary was recently purchased. Um, it is now a wholly owned subsidiary of a, of a different company that appears to be um, moving forward with the project. They were giving us advance notice of their 45-day notice, so that if the town um, or its committees wish to review it and provide comment, we could do so. Okay. So, um, just some history. This is the project we had three, four um, hearings mm -hmm. on. We had a site visit out there. Um, at the time, the group that was proposing the project was looking for the town to write a letter of support, um, even though it wasn't required. So, we went through a fair amount of public process on this. This new group is not asking for a letter of support uh, and is basically just telling us, hey, this is going to be filed. So from a, a town's perspective, we can, um, we can write letters to, the, to them mm -hmm. at this point to comment on the plan itself. And file them with the public service board after they file their application. Sure. Correct? Yes. So they're not proposing a, a public hearing agenda like the last week the Ranger. So let me put on my planning commission hat for a minute. So <clears throat> back in the spring, we met and the Planning Commission met with Two Rivers out of Quichi. I think we had five meetings. Two of those meetings were joint meetings with Braintree, Brookfield, and Randolph, I believe, to talk about identifying sites for future solar and wind generation. And this was part of the initiative, the 2015 goals that the states created, correct, to become carbon free or something along that lines. And so the reason I think that some of this is happening is because at the present time, we don't have anything in our town plan that addresses this, and that's something that the Planning Commission was looking to work on. So we had recommendation, recommendations from Tua Radicuichi on this situation, but this is actually going to come a little bit before we're going to have an opportunity to chat about this on a timeline level for the planning commission process. Correct. We do not have an energy plan right. in, as a chapter of our town plan yet, mm -hmm. but it's underway. I think we got the planning grant for it. Right. Can you talk a little louder, please? Sure. I think we got the planning grant to do the effort. Um, but yeah, they're, they have to be in compliance with the town plan. And our town plan is not going to have anything in it that they have to comply with for savings. So I'm kind of beating us to the punch. <laughs> so at this point, it would just, if, if the board were to choose, they could provide comment, we could postpone it until the next meeting. Um, it, it has a choice either it struck me to uh, draft a, a draft letter to then share with the board of the right instruction or again postpone it until that's needed. I think at a minimum we need to send this to the planning commission and the uh, energy committee for comment. It is on the planning commission's agenda for the next meeting, I will tell you that. So okay. Does it make sense to write this group a letter saying that we would like them to hold off on their plans until we have a town plan in place? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it would be wonderful if I think you could, but. <laughs> Can't hurt, right? We'll be voicing our, our intention. They have cut out everything that was in there um, that Ranger Solar had. Mm -hmm. um, the hearings in the town and the meetings from the letter of support from the payments to the town on top of what their taxes will be, all that's been stripped out. It was 
They're they're going to that they're not going to be quite before. as friendly as they were before. Okay. Yeah. Hear that um, yeah. Yeah, I hear it. It looks to me like it'll be submitted and and it will be on the 45 day clock. So anytime we can get ahead of that, we're probably you know committees and folks want to chime in. Mm -hmm. um, that would be it. This process yeah. will put more yeah. onus on the abutting landowners to take action than the town to take action. I'm, I'm not. I'm having trouble hearing. Um, maybe because my ears are stuffed up. But um, I'm not familiar with this project that's being proposed. But I regularly do work at the Public Utility Commission, um, and I regularly represent municipalities before the Public Utility Commission. So I, I'm trying to understand. Um, it sounds like we're concerned because this is not being cited in a place that perhaps would be one of the um, preferred areas of the town that ultimately the planning commission may identify as being areas that, that we would support for solar projects. And it sounds like there's perhaps some budding landowners that will not be happy about this. Has, is, is there a consensus at the town in terms of um, what position is, is this a project? Because we're I'm hearing they're beating us to the punch, and yeah, but apparently they are. If we don't have this list of kind of like about preferred sites, and you know, have our ducks in a row in terms of any applicant that comes down the pike now. So my question is, um, hearing yeah, there may be some more onus on the abutting landowners. They, well, there, there are basically two ways for municipalities to participate in these kinds of uh, proceedings. One is having that, you know, those sites identified or having your town plan indicate, you know, where they are and it's required and all that. But the other is for the town to actually be involved in the permitting process and to take positions about certain issues. And I would encourage the town to not feel that they are without any ability to intervene here and to try to effectuate um, you know, either changes to this application or to defeat this application. And again, I know nothing about this application. I'm just trying to provide some information about other ways that the town may uh, be involved in this process to try to either defeat or shape it in a different way that suits our needs, even if we don't have all our planning documents in a row and can rely on that in order to guide where the projects may go. I'd be happy to assist in any way that I can if um, the select board wants to discuss it. I know we don't want to incur attorney's fees by hiring necessarily somebody to go, but because we have folks that have lots of planning experience, the planning commission can go and have a representative from the planning commission represent the planning commission's interest there, or someone from the select board, or even a designee um, of somebody in the community. Uh, so I just want to be sure that we don't feel that we don't have um, some arrows in our quiver if the town believes that there is a need to intervene in a proceeding because it is not, you know, a goal uh, or within the vision that we have for our town. Oh, I have a comment as someone who attended some of those uh, public meetings, and I think one of the main objections, if I recall, and I could be corrected, was the fact about these wrecks were going to be sold off to people in Connecticut. Or to, so it was basically sort of asset stripping. In other words, it wasn't that the town or, or even private individuals in the town were going to be getting the benefits. It was really all the benefits of this were going off-site and out-of-state. And that was a main issue for me in terms of my personal objection to it, you know, for whatever that's worth. Um, th just, just to bring that into discussion, so I'm not sure if everyone was really up to speed on that. What is happening? Believe they can be sold out of state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, that does seem like defeating the purpose of su supporting the local economies, supporting you know, things within Vermont versus, you know, Connecticut just coming and basically farming us and using us as farm animals. It's how it's working out. Solar farm to meet their exactly. energy requirements. To meet, right, to, to, to cover their situation. That was a problem, problem for, for me personally. One right behind you. Um, I went to several of those meetings too, and I was uh, going to be part of the energy committee, and I went to a lot of their, their committee. 
uh, meetings, and as far as I understood, they were against this project, and uh, if it's the same project. I think you meant equally split on the project. So, so uh, and I know that there was this question before, so, uh, and I know that uh, the, the select board didn't really know quite, they knew that it wasn't going to make the big difference, and, and they, they didn't have power, they didn't feel that they had power to say, no, you can't do it. But I think, and I think you're right, we need, you know, the, 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 the select board and the, uh, needs to make a decision about whether they support it or not. And, um, but I think we have quite a few people in, in, the, uh, in town that are looking at whether we're getting any kind of credit from it, whether it's good for us as a town to, to take that much land out of, uh, out of that particular use. And I know people have bought, you know, Ranger has, has uh, or whatever it's called now, is, has bought the land that they want to use for it. So. My name is John Mazzupo, and all I'd say is I agree with all three people what they said. I do it, too. It, it makes it makes sense what they said. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So does it make sense that our first stop is with our energy committee and our planning commission to get their take on the application? <coughs> Again, <laughs> yeah. it's different. It is different. The layout's different, um, not by a lot, but it's a little bit different. So, um, as far as I know, there wasn't a lot of trust felt in it in those meetings regarding this company. I think some of the representatives of it were a little bit challenging, but it makes sense. Mm -hmm. and I, I would add having a, a way to have some kind of statement that's proactive, you know, about what we are willing to accept and maybe including as long as the power is going to stay here, you know, in the, in the general area. Things like that I think would be really helpful to, you know, create those guidelines so that when companies do come forward, we've got a clear plan and an idea. <coughs> Um, maybe someone can check my understanding of but I believe that the biggest difference with this proposal compared to the prior one is that they're no longer going to apply for rates under some arcane federal law that allows them rates at a specified rate that was quite beneficial to the to Ranger Solar. And I think, I don't know if that's no longer available or if they've just reconsidered that. So they're not going to do that anymore. And I'm assuming that's why it's not going to be as profitable for them and why. Is it true that we're not hearing about any financial remuneration to the town other than presumably assessed value and taxes? Mm -hmm. So they've stripped all that out? Mm -hmm. So that, to me, changes it quite a lot. Um, Considering, um, I'm going to just bring up again something we talked about before at the select board level, is that this project almost for sure has to decrease the resale value of a significant number of homes that are in that bowl above it. And it's, we had some argument about it, but I'd be willing to put $100 down that five years later we could identify a number of properties that are not selling and perhaps, perhaps house might suck lots that are not developable with new houses because of the view shed being impacted. 110 acres that's fenced is a huge visual impact. And Skeeto Road and um, Elaine Sewell's old house under the water tower will never be the same. So that's not the only economic consideration is just one, so we will have that effect. I'm going to go down the record as saying I believe that to be the case. So if there's not something offsetting to the town, I have to raise the question, why would we support this? One of the challenges is they're not asking for that letter of support either. Yeah. No money, no letter of support. 
Um, I don't know if the Planning Commission uh, members would know, or maybe Brooke, if you would, uh, when the legislature passed the, 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 the statutes that provide for the towns to set up these energy uh, preferred siting areas, was there was there anything in there that would um, ask any developer to hold off until these towns had those plans in place? Is there any any type of uh, precedent set by that, or 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 is this a sort of a, a race to the public? How how do you think the Public Utilities Commission is going to view the fact that Randolph is undertaking this in their planning commission, looking at siting where they have been given the chance by the legislature to intervene, and what uh, process that I, I believe that they hadn't. Had as much um, say in it, you can correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, if a developer of a, a project this size is proposing to get that done just ahead of when the town may have their project, their thing done, is there is there any way to uh, beyond the process that you described to, or, or if anybody else knows if there's any other language available that would ask that to, they hold off till our process is done? Do it, staff. Um, all right, so generally the rules that apply, if you will, are the rules that are in effect when an application goes in. And it's known as vested rights. So if the law has not changed yet to a new town plan, for example, you are stuck with um, measuring the project against the town plan that is in, that is valid at the time the application goes in. Now, there is a, an exception to that if, for example, a select board has noticed that they have to give a 30-day notice for a, for a hearing to change your zoning ordinance or your town plan or whatever process document that you're talking about. Um, if the actual notice has gone out that this will be voted on in 30 days and we have the document but it's not law yet, um, that, that's actually the deadline. Now here, we're just working and planning and, and it's a process that has not come to fruition yet with a new document, so we're stuck with the existing town plan. In terms of those uh, preferred sites, um, you know, the, the measure is, are you in compliance with the town plan? If the town plan says, this is where we're going to allow solar facilities and you're proposing it for some other place, well, then you can't comply with the town plan. It's sort of a very simplistic way to, to try to explain it. Um, so it's, it's your rights to the law vest at the time that you put an application. Now, we could certainly, you know, say to someone, gee, would you hold off, we're changing it, and we, and we want to eliminate the site that you're looking at. It's probably doubtful that they would be willing to step aside. One of the issues that, um, that is important to any kinds of these solar projects, particularly because of diminishing um, financial incentives under the Trump administration, for example. Um, a lot of these develop solar is changing somewhat. It is no longer being as profitable. So right now we are seeing sort of a oh my gosh, we got to get our projects through before we lose all these financial incentives. The other thing is that the public sector used to be called the Public Service Board, it's now called Public Utility Commission. So the Public Utility Commission rules have actually changed, um, and it is more onerous now to get a permit for a large solar project than it used to be. Um, so there are a lot of things going on, but that's why it's really important that towns understand that they have, they can get standing in these cases. They don't have to go through all of the hoops that an abutting landowner might have to do to say, well, you know, I think orderly development is something that I have an interest in. Orderly development would be the criteria that you would attack if you believe that a solar project would diminish property values in the town, surrounding it, abutting, whatever. A, per, a property owner going to the tribunal and saying, Public Service Board, I don't want this project because my property is going to lose value. That is not going to be sufficient. That's not a reason for anybody to stop a project. If a town comes and says, the orderly development of our town is adversely, unduly adversely impacted by this project because we're going to lose tax revenue of a million bucks because all of these properties are going to have to be repraised because they will diminish in value when this project goes in. 
that is a much more powerful approach for the actual municipality to have a lot more say in this and to advance a challenge on a criteria that will have meaning. Whereas an individual landowner would just be dismissed out of, I mean, we don't care about your individual property. It would have to be demonstrated in the context of what impact it would have on the town and the grand list and our ability to pay our bills. So that, those are the kinds of things. Excellent to get the planning commission involved in the energy committee. Um, just pay incredibly close attention to those deadlines. They come fast and furious and intervening in this. You, you need to file your motion on time and try to get in. If, and, and I would recommend the town do it just to get your foot in the door, even if there's a dispute about what position that the town will take, uh, to make sure that we don't miss that opportunity if we're still getting our ducks in a row trying to analyze and determine whether this is a good or bad project for the town and whether the town supports it or not. Hmm. The issue of they're not offering any tax incentives now plays right into and dovetails with the issue of we lose our tax revenue. Because the developers would go in and say, don't worry about the orderly development. Don't worry about the taxes. We're alleviating that problem for the municipality because we're giving them all this money. And if we're not getting the money now, we have a pretty good argument. And sometimes taking a stand, uh, intervening as a municipality, leads to other options like negotiating settlements where maybe that money can be found. Maybe mitigation can occur in terms of the ultimate, you know, expense to the town for lost tax revenues. Just really quickly, there there are other issues involved also that were enumerated and described in the past that I I won't bring up again. But those issues that were just raised are not the only issues. And if anybody wants to hear them again, especially if you're new to the board, I'd be willing to be personally with you. Sure. I'm not against, I don't think that we are, quote, against solar. It's the magnitude of, along with some other issues. I did get an email from a resident up there that's concerned they're showing a right away across their property, which they haven't granted and have no desire. I have, to I have hearing aids and I still can't hear you. I'm yeah, sorry. I can't either. Yeah. Yeah. Get you a mic. I received an email from a resident mm -hmm. up there who's concerned they show an access across their land to connect to the three phase and they haven't granted it and have no desire to grant it. Mm -hmm. So I think they've got some other challenges coming. There's also no decommissioning bond proposed in this new plan. So they have no, no plan for what happens at the end of this if they were to go belly up and who's stuck having to clean up the mess. So they're still missing some pretty big pieces, it appears, in this plan. But I think it would be good if we can get a couple of the committees that are focused on this type of development and these issues to Thank push you. it out. Because last time we were split all across town. We were in a 50-50, basically, of support and non-support. So we would need to know what are the issues and where does the town stand on them? So take a position. Any questions, comments, thoughts? Appreciate all the input. Yeah, spirited one again. Mm -hmm. It would be good if we, when we give that to those committees, we can give them a deadline to get it back to us, especially knowing that this is going in for five minutes. And at that point, we'll have 45 days to put any response together. Maybe one more time to look at their next meetings okay. of each of those groups. And it sounds like the planning commission didn't want it. It's already on the agenda for the planning commission. Okay. Uh, committees, councils, and representative appointees. We're going to appoint people to committees. It can be a very exciting topic.
Everybody put your hand up. Okay. So we have a list. That's uh, the the background section, all of the individuals listed here, with the exception of our existing townkeeper, we have not been able to confirm whether uh, he was uh, is interested in continuing with the project or with the commission. Everyone else has confirmed that they would like to continue um, serving in their specific roles. Uh, we do have a stagecoach representative that was appointed to fulfill uh, a position that had been vacated halfway through, but that term expires, uh, or expired yesterday. They have not expressed an interest in continuing, no. Um, she did in the interview. She did know that she would continue. Yeah. And yeah, that was so recent, I'm sure she's interested, yeah. There's only a couple months. It's only been a I don't believe Stagecoach has met as a group during the time that she was appointed to now. Three <laughs> meeting postponements and then she had to... It seemed to be premature to kick her off. Yeah. 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 Look how many people left the room, huh? Uh, Somebody wanted to put their hands up. Exciting stuff. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hold on a primary. Uh, no, I think she may be in the primary in the alternate. Uh, Michael raised a, a good point in that he is listed as the alternate for the LEPC, uh, and also further down, Winston Sadu is also the alternate for Kira Rigarabichi. I just want to point out that he does not have alternate listed next to his name, but he is the alternate. Okay, what's the town service officer? We might have to take her right here. <laughs> <laughs> there are some positions and committees that I'm still trying to learn about. For example, just a different example is the town history committee. Um, they tried to speak with our longer serving staff members, and even they were questioning, questioning whether or not any of the former members are still living. Um, you know, when they last on that. I don't think so. Uh, yeah. I think the last one might have been Mim Herwig. Yeah. So, um, oh. I was just wondering, is the Town History Committee connected to the Randolph Historical Society, or are they totally separate? They're two separate groups. Uh, that I was able to, to learn. Uh, they're two separate groups. But we could get them to work together to merge. Yeah. I think former select woman uh, Marjorie Ryerson was involved with the Town History Committee. It might be a person you could hang to sure. ask about that. I went to a couple of their meetings. Did you do that? She was a select board liaison, huh? Maybe. She might have been a select board liaison at the time. She could have been, yeah. yeah. Okay. So we think uh, Ruth was on for longer with stagecoach. If someone um, closed the doors, I can't figure out how to do it, but it's noisy. I'm going to grab that. Let's see if I can figure okay. it out. I have no idea. There's a thing in behind it at the top. Tritown Solid Waste Alliance. Um, oh, thanks. This is a representative that meets with the other municipalities That's that right. are part of that group um, dealing with the landfill, hazardous waste collection day, mm -hmm. all that good stuff. I believe it was recently renamed to the Mountain Alliance, so it needed some updating and uh, that position would have to be filled by a member of the select board. Uh, listed on page two, basically <laughs> says Mountain Alliance, Tri Town Alliance, which I added. Uh, but in our previous list, it was specifically listed only as Tri Town Solid Waste Alliance. But we just it had not been updated in some time. The previous representative was uh, Ross Evans. Anybody dying to participate in that one? The mayor is done. It's got a new agreement. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I need to move on. So it's um, 
<laughs> I do most of the work, so. <laughs> you do most of the work. I mean, All you need yeah. is a face. Is we is manage the a smile and the whole thing. Uh -huh. And waving. <laughs> okay. Not be good at that. Smiling and waving. Who? <laughs> Nobody's dying for it. Nobody's dying for that. No, I'll do it. I have four kids that create waste. I'm going to do that. Okay. Going to test the type responsible. Mm hmm. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Waiver Valley Ambulance alternative. That can be anybody. It doesn't yeah. have to be a board member. Anybody out there? Jessica's waving her hand. This is like an option right now. Yeah. What are so the responsibilities? Uh, it's an alternate, so when Steve Webster can't go to the board meetings, it's filling in for him. <clears throat> but you have to stay up to speed. So lots of times the alternate goes too, but the board member just, then you get one vote between the two. So it's how often? I think they meet every two weeks. What Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> see a lot of head shaking going on up there. <laughs> now it's not a good time for that? <laughs> Every two months is good. Every two weeks. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> no takers on that one either, huh? Right. We're going to have to wait on that a little bit. Uh, Conservation Commission. We have three positions. Rolling, we have uh, Jenny Davis. And Michael Van Dyke, are they, they haven't confirmed that they want to continue? Michael has confirmed. I have not been able to confirm with Jenny. I believe she's. So, does anybody have any issues Your with Mike? Your both. See three points. Did I, I could have confirmed with her. Your note both. See three points. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Jenny does see three points. So, we have Jenny's two good. of them yeah. and Justin. <coughs> Yeah, I think you can add it. It fills in the uh, full group. Anybody have any concerns? No, I'm fine with that. Whims, wishes, desires? No, nope. sounds like a way to do it to me. What's that? What did you think? Okay. Excuse me, is that taking into consideration the person who offered Justin? We just added her in. Oh, you did? Okay, sorry. Yep. Just uh, Economic Development Council. We have two terms expiring. I was not able to update the note that I placed for the board here that indicates that no response from either member. Both Winston, uh, Winston sent a note today saying that he would like to continue, and Ken confirmed uh, yesterday evening that he would like to continue. Great. So we have those two that want to continue, and we also have uh, Tom, who's here expressed an interest. So that would mean one of them would not continue if we put it. No, there's a, there's a oh, there's a vacant at the bottom. There's a vacant. Yeah. Um, I, actually, fonts. I actually emailed today to apply for that. Just I don't know if that's relevant now or it needs to wait till the next meeting. For the open position. For the open position on the um, economic development council. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't receive your email. No, because I, I emailed it after business hours, so. Oh. Yeah. And Jessica Taffet, T-A-F-F-E-T. That's a long blood in it. It's a dilemma. <laughs> it's the most popular place to be. <laughs> Can you give us some background on, of your background? Like what you put in the email? Maybe? Oh, well, I asked what is the application process because I, because it said if you're interested, email, send this email. Oh, so you said so, the same question. What this and said I would like to apply to be on it. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. 
Yeah, sure. So I've been to an economic development council meeting before, and I was really interested in the um, activities they were doing, including um, making the brochure. And I saw the um, TV uh, position, the TV advertisement that they did. I'm also really interested in um, Perry's idea to hire an economic development coordinator for the town, and that's a project I would love to work on. Um, I own my own small business in Randolph in addition to working um, for an agency. Um, and I'm a 27-year-old person who moved to Randolph from out of state four years ago. And so I'm really interested in the economic development of Randolph. And I'm really interested in revitalizing our downtown and encouraging businesses to move here in many ways, including outreach, um, including um, whatever we can do in terms of tax incentives for businesses. So yep, do you have any other questions? <laughs> Hmm. Yeah, can we have another board member? <laughs> no, I know we can't. I know. I know. Why not? We can't if we go back in and change it. I think, that's in the, I think that's in the town plan right now, is the number is set by the town plan. If I'm not mistaken, I think we chose. Hmm. <clears throat> well, um, Mr. Hooper, they need hey. for economic development, which I heard from all of our select board um, candidates. Yeah. <laughs> um, if I can just speak on behalf of Jessica, I have worked with her, um, and I am an attorney for those of you who may not know that. Um, she is incredibly um, organized, energetic jumps in and, uh, and volunteers to do any task, puts amazing information together in terms of visual um, documents and marketing materials. Um, she is incredibly <coughs> articulate, writes very well, and has a genuine interest in our community, our economic development, um, food security, and other issues that are incredibly important and relevant to the town of Randolph right now. So. I certainly would support her for it. I think she did a great job. I don't know any of the other folks. I didn't hear the names, but that's so my two next cents. So <laughs> next to you. Next to you. You know, you can do it. I don't need to compete either. No, I, like, if he did it first, he can just do it. But I, if there's a vacancy, I'd like to be first on the waiting list. There's one vacancy yeah. right now. I thought we had two. Well, it says here, Winston's. When I looked online, the, it said you had two. Any town report, it says there is only six people, so if we have eight, mm -hmm. on the website, it mm -hmm. says there are That's two people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's seven seats of which we have. And I don't want to complete these. Six I'd rather partner with you. Sounds like we're working on a compromise back there. Would it work if we put some in, and then if we looked at the process, it could add more to the committee? And the I'm sorry, I missed She's nodding. Oh. <laughs> we signed you right in for a whole bunch there. You nodded. <laughs> what we talked about was taking the existing committee members that want to continue. We haven't heard anything from the committee that they're dysfunctional. Usually we get that. Two um, of the members are here. Yeah, we've got Roger and Jay here. If yeah. we take the vacant position and put Tom into it and then look at what the rules are as far as expanding that committee and sure. if it has to be part of the town plan rewrite, which we're underway with right now, we can address it there or we look at it that way. And then this is a list that takes us about three months to complete for the other nine months of work, um, but it's uh, They're done now. <laughs> usually it's waiting for people to step up at once get in. Just as a suggestion, yeah. Uh, my understanding is these are open meetings to the public. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we would welcome your attendance, mm -hmm. and I don't know if commentary were made that you would find a difference between being an official member and helping us to, you know, participate in any decision making. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, my, my, I've attended one meeting, but I've served, as I mentioned earlier, on economic development and neighborhood revitalization um, committees in other municipalities. 
predominantly Burlington and Winooski. And um, believe me, anybody that shows up at a meeting and volunteers to assist us in any um, anything like that, um, you know, be careful what you ask for because you'll be handed. <laughs> please, <laughs> please, please, please. It looks like the missing person is Ross, who was the select board. Member, I mean, I'm looking at the list that's on the website that mm -hmm. says there's two openings. So well, the there's board, you have to have a select board. We haven't put the select board person on yet. Right. We're so about the committee right now. Huh? And you need seven total. Is that right or nine? Seven plus the select board member. Okay. Uh, then yeah, that. that so Ross checks out. wasn't actually a member. He was the. He's the select board. He's the liaison. He's the liaison. Yeah. And he's staying on the sewer yeah. and water, I think, but not. Yeah. At home. So I guess my comment would be, if, if you guys were agreeable to that, because this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart, as you all know, mm -hmm. I would certainly encourage you to invite Jessica to come to those meetings, and then if something down the road should change, then, you know, if you have somebody who decides to resign, she would be very much up to speed if she'd be willing to participate. Terrific. Uh, the next meeting's at 530 at the bank on Monday. Great. Thanks. Oh, I thought we were going to reschedule that. Remember? Yeah, yeah, we might. Do you might reschedule that. <laughs> in, the event that <laughs> in the event that that is rescheduled. But someone we'll someone sure gets our email address. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I guess that's how I would run that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so back to discussing as the board, are we comfortable putting Tom on as the seventh member? I'm agreeable with that. And while we're on this, uh, do we have a select board member who wants to? Oh, I would love to do that. Anybody else want that job? It seems like an interesting job, but I think you should do it. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Okay. You know, well, it's a subject that's near and dear to my heart, I will I tell you. Yes, so. no, it's, it's very clear that that's true, and I think you bring a lot of energy to it. So. Okay. Sounds like a great So idea. I would be more than happy to take that position. I want to point out just one thing that uh, I rechecked my messages just because I noticed I had not updated the Economic Development Council portion. Uh, going back to Conservation Commission, I actually did not receive a direct confirmation from, from Jenny with regard to her interest in continuing in the Conservation Commission. So I'm pretty sure she's interested. She wants to do that? Okay. okay. We're, we're close. <laughs> okay, recreation. There is currently one vacancy due to a recent um, uh, self resignation from the position. I have received two last minute um, requests to join. I was not able to compile the information in, uh, with enough time to add it to this meeting, but there are two candidates that are interested in, in that one vacancy. Mm -hmm. um, I know, I'm actually a member of that committee in addition to being the liaison, and if we have two people who are really interested in being, like, you know, fully voting members of that committee, and it seems like we'll bring a lot of good energy to it. I would be happy to not be a voting member and just be the liaison to make room for someone who wants to, you know, come to this meeting. Okay. School call and cancel. Oh, gosh. Because <laughs> it's scary out here. Yeah. See, but when I get it, I think it's Elaine Millington calling. Um so we'll have those names at the next meeting. Yes. It's fine. Add them then. Yeah. And Perfect. we'll leave you on as liaison for that. Is that uh, what I heard? Yeah, yeah, I'd I'd like to remain a part of the committee in some fashion. Okay. All right. The remaining list. Uh, from capital to energy, uh, um, I can only speak to a handful of committees that have uh, indicated that they would not like to see a change in their membership. Uh, the others, I am still trying to confirm membership, uh, want to point out, which is the Town History Committee. Uh, but the others, I'm still working to confirm membership, their direct interests, and whether or not uh, they choose to continue or leave the committee. <coughs> 
Okay, so those will, we'll look at the membership of those <coughs> next time. Uh, if the board chooses to, yes. There is one I do want to point out that I did speak with Jerry earlier today via email with regard to EC Fiber. All three members of EC Fiber have indicated they would like to continue, that they require that a form be filled out by the board, that they receive the form, uh, again, not in time to be able to pull it together for the, the board to consider that, that form for signature. Okay. Let's put all those on April. Liaison for the Conservation Commission? I don't think there's been one. No. In the past, right? um, so, appointments and membership. Uh, DRB, it looks like we have an alternate. Josh, looking to step up into one of the positions. And Dan Devo, looking to be. Three point in for another term. Yes. And if the board were to uh, move Josh mm -hmm. up to a full member, then the one vacancy created, um, Paul Ray would like to fill that vacancy. He wants to be an alternate? An alternate. Okay. Mm hmm. And the Planning Commission has another vacancy? There's one vacancy for the Planning Commission. No letters yet? No for planning. Okay. No. The Design Review Advisory Commission. This is, um, is that the exit form? We don't do much. So, yeah. For a couple of people that don't want to do much. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually true. I mean, I put in a letter for that. So I've been in My name should be on there. You're in I put there? in a letter a couple weeks ago. Okay. For planning commission? No. Design so for design review? Design review. Design review, design review. Design review by, by Jake. Yeah. Okay. You should pick this guy. Yes. <laughs> 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 Was that emailed to me or? Sent it through Marty. Oh, through Marty, okay. I have a question of Perry, who said that your committee doesn't do much. Did you do anything in regard to the, um, all those buildings up at your Gwendolyn Center, the independent living? Independent living wasn't in our jurisdiction. Was what oh, was just outside? It wasn't in their jurisdiction. Oh, okay. Thank you. So there's a zone there. If you look in the, if you look on the in the in the um, town town maps, there's a map there that shows what's actually in that area. The last thing we worked on was the Kingwood Park building, I guess, the medical building. So that was the last project we worked on in that district. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how long that's been, three or four years now? At least. Yeah, I mean, there's just nothing that comes up. So I think prior to that, before I was on the committee, they worked on the McDonald's project and burn. Mm -hmm. so. so if anyone's interested, you get printed as people. Well, design and review. Well, basically what it is, is, is you're an advisory board, so you get them. What we did was, you know, they presented, they present. So in the case of the hospital situation I was involved in, um, you know, they came in with the, the design and the, um, the uh, architectural, how it's built out, and an overview of the project. And so you kind of look at that project and you're able to go through and you might suggest and recommend changes, but they're not binding. So, but they are something that you can present to the DRB and their consideration for granting the permit. So there's one vacancy? There, two. There's two right now. 
So are you considering Cameron for one of these two positions? Apparently so. If you submitted a... I'd have to check with Martin, but if check. you say you submitted one to Martin, yeah. and then there's wow. two other openings? I think there's one. No, there's one two other. openings total, so what we'll do is go back and check with Marty, see what she's got, and bring all the candidates that are interested forward into April. I'd be interested if there's an opening, unless anyone else wants to do it. Okay. You just have to her send list. in your interest. Okay. Send in an email Marty, to okay. Adolfo that says the committee you're interested in, some of your background, especially if we're going to have more than we have positions. What, what is that? I didn't quite understand what the confines of the district so, is. So what it is, your, any project that came comes before the DRB is kicked off to this board to look at the design of the project. So the aesthetics of the project. So in the case of the hospital, you know, we looked at things like what the building was going to look like. Did it fit the character of the area? You know, did they have enough trees in the, in the project? You know, in this particular case, there was members on the board who thought that they would like to see them eliminate one of the driveways. Um, that was a pretty controversial issue. Um, didn't, didn't happen that way. And so it's, you're an advisory board to the DRB to tell them whether or not you think this project fits the area. So the DRB can take the recommendations or not. And in the case, that case, I remember something about, you know, we thought that they should only have one driveway, but that's not how it ended up. So they made a case to the DRB and said we'd like them both. So that's kind of what you do. And Screening dumpsters. So it's basically like the exit four, quad, four quadrants. Yeah, there's, the there's a, how, you know, I don't know how the Kingwood Park piece got in there. It seemed to me like it was too low. But anyways, it's it has to do with the exit four quadrant. Okay. So I can't tell you the specific boundary lines, but here's a map that shows that. Another problem with this, and another consideration too, was which we have no, uh, only one person on here, which there was some discussion, and we might as well talk about it, because there was this design review district or panel for Randolph Center. So at one point, there was a discussion about merging those two, because that group has not yet... Uh, they did merge. They did merge. So they are right. merged now? Oh, no, they can cross over. Right. The members can serve on the other... Okay, so they can serve back and forth between the two? As alternates? Yeah. That's how you guys sorted it out? Okay. Not proposed to us by the planning commission. Yeah. Well, we didn't know. How you, we didn't know. I didn't know how you finished it off. So that was. This, this is a person, Carol Mowry. Her term expires in 2010. That's what the council. I think it's actually 19. Oh, okay. She's doing improved. Okay. <laughs> like committee was started two years ago. Or right. Two and and was, ago. Okay. That was a result of the zoning ordinances that were passed in Randolph Center. So they wanted some input on what could actually be done in Randolph Center. So. Because they lobbied for that, we created that in the zoning document. Unfortunately, they didn't come up with enough members within the district to fill the vacancies. So They wanted to say, but nobody wanted to say it. Exactly. <laughs> nobody wanted to be the bad guy. <laughs> Just so I understand, you said uh, you weren't involved with the, those buildings at the top of the hill. No. But you just referred to the hospital. What did you mean? Well, I wasn't involved in any of that. The hospital's building at Kingwood Park, the, the, the oh, former place, the former whatever, the, the hospital's property halfway down the hill. Oh, okay. Okay, what used to be Kingwood Park. Right, okay. Good. That one we were involved in. We weren't involved in anything in the center. And the center wasn't involved because they didn't have a We're not part of that district. That district, the district border lines, there's lines actually on a map that state what this group is responsible for to recommend or you know, to meet about and talk about. The, the, that committee he's referring to is within the historic district in Randolph Center. The Gifford right. property sits just outside the historic district. So no one's in charge of that? Uh, Carol is. The DRB is. <laughs> the DRB. But not the design All that. But not okay. the design part of that. The design group is in the historic area. Right. And then the design review advisory commission is down at the exit four area. There is a, a gap between the two. A, a the gap with a whole does. bunch of big buildings that evidently aren't looked at in that way, right? They're looked at by the Development Review Board. Yeah, let, let me just, <laughs> I think you're a little confused. So the DRB is the people, they're the people who make the decisions. Mm -hmm. These other little 
Mm. Uh, advisory boards, they may look at, at an issue in depth, like, you know, do we like the aesthetics of the design? Mm -hmm. And then they make a recommendation, but they don't have any power, and they can't force the DRB to go their way, which, right. you know, I don't know whether the driveway example is one of that. But yeah, the driveway was one of those examples. So DRB makes the decision. These are helpers to that process. Yeah, well, I have but no power over the ordering side. machines at McDonald's. Okay, but it, then they are yeah. getting advice one. from a different group. Yeah. Right? Well, they are. Not okay, so like what you're talking about, the orchard, the mm -hmm. uh, buildings, the, yeah. the senior housing, um, there's no special group that advises the DRB. The DRB has to do their own work on that. The DRB is the group. The yeah. DRB is the group. Yeah. Right. The other group in the center only dealt with this historic district. That's what they asked for. So that was to control, to make sure things, I mean, examples that they brought up were, okay, so for example, not putting an addition on a house up there that didn't match the character of the neighborhood. So, for example, if we've got houses up there that all had clapboards, we didn't want to put vinyl siding on those houses. So that's why they wanted some say in what was going to go in that district. And so from the Planning Commission standpoint, we granted them that ability to do that. And so that was adopted in the zoning ordinances for the, the last, those zoning ordinances that we passed here a couple of years ago. But to this point, there's only been Carol Mallory that served on the board. So as you guys move to make the two groups overlap, it's to solve that problem. So. Okay. I think that was part of your stint there, Candy, wasn't it? That was a long discussion about that up there. Were you part of that? The very end, yeah. The very end of it. Not the whole discussion, no. It was quite a, it was quite a lengthy process to get to that point. So we gave them what they wanted. Okay. So if anybody's interested in review, in serving on that one, it's another one that doesn't have a whole lot of work. <laughs> well, uh, just for a little history's sake, my husband worked on a uh, design review uh, document for about six years along with the committee, and it was submitted to the select board, and it was proceeded to be ignored. And that was the design advisory group was I believe, meant to uh, oversee designs of things in the area we're talking about, you know, surrounding the historical district. And so um, it's unfortunate, it seems to me. But thank you for bringing me up to date anyway. Well, we actually did adopt that because we used some of Bill's information to come up with what we did up there. So that's actually how that came to be, was some of those maps that Bill had come up with were part of that process. Carolyn Lumbra, was, was extremely involved in that, so I mean, you could chat with her a little bit more about that, but so that's why we got to that point. Right, but I'll just state that all their work was ignored by the select board, and it doesn't make people want to a volunteer for things that know about you know, that were involved in that. Well, that's why we fixed it. That's why when Not planning much commission. Of a fix. Pardon? Not much of a fix, but... Well, I, but we gave okay. them what they asked for, and, and I will tell you, the process was very open, very transparent, and you know, we actually had to encourage them to come to the meetings because they started the process and then they dropped the ball. So we thought they were done talking about it. So we actually reached back out to them and got them involved in the process towards the end of the zoning document and said, do you guys want, to want this or not? Because we, you know, we haven't heard anything. And so we reached back out to them and that's why that design review commission came to be. So we gave them a district and we gave them the ability to put some people there. Now, that's all we can do. Tonight we're talking about who wants to be on. Who wants to yeah, be on it? Sorry. So mm -hmm. we can well, thank you for the update. table that one. So uh, water and wastewater advisory committee. Um, is this the one Ross wants to stay on? That's right. Mm -hmm. And so we have um, we need a select board liaison for that one. And this one can have five to seven members, and it's at three. Mm. We don't even have. Are they eight? <clears throat> there are five. Just, yeah, they can as long as all three make it. I do know that this committee is soon going to be. I'm not sure if it'll entice anyone. We'll soon be reviewing or at the very least discussing ways to make uh, impact fees more um, or less impactful to new businesses. Um, so that it has an economic development component to it in a more immediate effect. Mm 
What do you think about that one? <laughs> Another area. <clears throat> okay, so we're good with the three that are on there now. We'll have to add that one to the list to advertise. Okay. We can have five to seven members on that one. The Economic Development Council has bylaws somewhere that are quoted here as controlling the membership at seven. So we would have to change those to, to change that mix. Okay. Okay. Anybody jump on, chomp in a bit for that one? Want to think about it? For Decide anything? Water. 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 I would do the water one. Just this on the side. Ross said it was just a great time. So. Yeah, the year I did it was. And, and I might, he lives across the street, but I might actually get to see him once in a while if, <laughs> if I go to the committee meeting. <laughs> Other than when he's running in and out of his house. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Especially in the winter. We also get a board rep for capital planning budget. That's right. Do we need one for EC Fiber as well, or is that no, straight? No, that's a straight delegate. Yeah. Which one did you say? Capital planning. Fire advisory has one. <clears throat> Energy has one. Do we want to do that part of it tonight? So for budget committee, we have a. Matt said he'll do capital planning. Maybe not out loud, so I'll speak for him. Okay. <laughs> so on top of capital planning, we have the regular budget committee, of which we have a board member that's. Unless somebody wants to take it, I'll continue. There was some, it was confirmed with staff on whether a select board liaison was needed for the budget committee, so we were searching through, I understand that there has been a liaison, but we were searching through the initial creation of the budget committee as it was created um, early 90s, late 80s, I believe. Um, and so we have not yet been able to confirm whether a board member liaison is required for budget committee, but um, there has been one on the committee in the past. I don't know if it's required. I think it's a good idea to have Yeah. It seems to be how we're picking up on some of that, unless they're going to get committed to coming in and doing the presentations. I, I, I did get some pushback from the committee on their requirements with regard to quarterly presentations. Um, there was, uh, it did not happen at the town meeting yesterday, but there have been discussions on potentially amending the requirements or the bylaws for the budget committee because the members were choosing not to do the quarterly um, briefings as they're supposed to be doing. So that's an ongoing discussion with the committee and I'm hoping to have them come in at some point to speak with the board. They also didn't want to provide their official thumbs up or down on the budget, which they were supposed to do. Yeah. Huh. Hmm. So they just meet and talk about the expenses to date, and that appears to be all they want to do. Hmm. Really? <laughs> I served on that committee one time. They held my feet to the fire pretty hard. <laughs> How did you like it? Well, we did it. <laughs> we did answer for it. All right, so Mike wants to continue with one. Yeah, I can continue with it. That's awesome. You're going to turn um, the thumb screws down a little there. I advised them as a ex officio okay. non voting member that those were their responsibilities. Uh, okay. And they did push back, and I provided them with their bylaws. Uh -huh. And then they still didn't do it. Okay. Who are these people? Okay. So fire service advisory board, do you go to those meetings anyway? No, I only, I usually Jay and Larry take them, but I can continue. Anybody else want to come and talk about communications and truck space? <coughs> hmm. 
it's terribly exciting as well. Is this pretty exciting? I, I think yeah. what we need is a, for some people, a clarification on what committees we can actually vote on. Because we're liaisons to a lot of them, and we can't vote on all of them. So it would be good to know if we can actually vote or not. On. So, can we hold off that? so can we hold off on that until we actually, I mean, I'd like to know which ones you do have a little say in here. So. Fire advisory, we can't vote on. Okay. More access issues. Think members of each department. But yeah, so, that one. yeah, okay. Well, I think I'd like to know which ones you can vote on. Vote on any of them. We have the power of the pen. You can change it, huh? Okay. Well, I'm not sure I want to do that. But. Uh, energy committee. Uh, so I'm the liaison to the energy committee right now. <coughs> mm -hmm. I'd be happy to continue in that role. Hmm. Unless someone really wants it, I could give it up too. No, I might take on the fire one. We'll see. I'm thinking about it. Maybe. I might consider that one. Give me a, give me a month. You might be disappointed. Yeah, you might be frustrated or disappointed. Just disappointed. <laughs> okay. Really not a lot of activity. Okay. But it might well. give Mike a night off. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let me ponder that. We don't have to make that decision tonight. Citizen right? Advisory Board. That is also is one that I'm seeking to get clarification on. I know, I believe it is chaired by Sergeant Stallnicker from the Village Police Department. Um, I'm hoping to speak with her very soon uh, so we could get more information on their ongoing work. Um, yep. What is it? What is it? So yeah. this is a group that meets and talks about um, reintegration of folks coming out of prison. Oh. Um, I think we need to figure out how we are going to get the communication back from the liaisons of these committees. Um, you really good at that last year, but um, I think it's important if we don't have a liaison to this committee that we get a report from them. Yep. Um, because we've had a few um, colorful folks that came back in and there was like no warning, no yep. advance notice to the select board or to members of the yeah. public. And, and I see that kind of <coughs> something we probably ought to know. Yep. We have a potential strategy going forward for cross-pollination between the different committees and the different commissions. Um, and that's to have, under, with the understanding that every committee or commission or council has their chair, in order to be able to get everyone talking and ideas crossing boundaries because a lot of the work that's being done actually affects other committees. Um, uh, for example, water, wastewater, you know, the, someone who may be interested just in the water quality or water issues may not necessarily understand how impact fees are affecting the development of the economy in the town. So what we're hoping to do is to create a either a quarterly or some time frame where all the chairs can actually come together to brief each other on what they're working on, what they have coming down the pipe, and to provide each other with this information. And we, one of the strategies that we can put together is also have them at some point, not all in one select board meeting, but periodically have two or three committee chairs come in to discuss their work with the board, similar to what uh, RACBC and uh, uh, John Copans did today. that have done things in the community to keep them from ever having that report in the courts or that paper trail. And I think they come up with creative ways to, for the, things for the kids to do to learn from their bad choices. Is that restorative justice? It's similar, yeah. Um, I think that's, so, when I was on it anyway. Yeah, I think there's some direct work with Orange County, with the county itself. Yep. Um, I'm not entirely familiar with the actual connection, but, but you're right. Orange yeah. County Sheriff usually attends the meetings. Okay. 
add something? I lived in Alaska for eight years, and there was a really great program up in the Fairbanks area for restorative justice that was well you know, documented, a lot of a lot of input and study around it. it. Might be something worth you know having a committee look at what what really works other places. And, I'm sure they're probably doing some of that already. I would hope. Changes is um, the LEPC rep for Mike goes to an alternate. <coughs> Two Rivers Anaquichi rep for Winston goes to an alternate. <coughs> Tri Town Solid Waste Alliance <coughs> representative is Matt. Budget Committee Mike is the liaison. Conservation Commission is fully seated, adding Jessamine West that committee. Economic Development Council, uh, the current list gets reseated with uh, Tom Avers taking the vacant seat and Perry being the select board liaison. And they will include Jessica in their invites when they changing this. Recreation Committee has Larry as a liaison, and we have some applications we'll evaluate for that. Capital planning and budget, uh, Matt as a liaison. Fire advisory, Mike with Perry Arm Wrestling if he decides he wants to. Mm -hmm. Energy committee has uh, Larry as a liaison. Uh, DRB. We have uh, an alternate coming up, Josh, as a member. <coughs> Dan DeBeau reappointed as a member. Paul Ray as an alternate. In the Water Wastewater Committee, we have Larry as the liaison. The others, we have some emails to find and sort out and bring forward for the April meeting. The board like to reappoint. I'm not sure if, just want to clarify, we were appointed Ross, Suzanne, and John? Yes. Okay. And look for some more. Look for supposed more. to have five to seven. Yeah. I think there would be some interest in that with the manganese issue and the potential need for a million dollar cleanup. <clears throat> or free, if I get my way. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay. I might help you with that one too. So, um, <laughs> well, I, is I have a class two water operator license. I haven't renewed it, but I had one. Is there any comments? Second, notes? please. Anybody have anything different when they took their notes on that? Just to make sure I'm nope. kind of in sync. Yep, comments on the back? Um, we'll have a couple of comments. I don't know if this is the right time or not. Are you guys, is, is this an open comment period or just no. on what? Only on committee appointments. Okay. The other business is coming up. Okay, so maybe I'll wait for other business. Would that be a better time or? Uh, if it was something that's not on the agenda, the time was at the beginning when we did public comment under item okay. three. I have a quick comment about with uh, Adolfo just brought up in that Perry comment on uh, regarding the, regarding the water quality issue. I think we're not talking water quality. We're talking about that being a topic on the okay on that committee's agenda. We were talking about that it would be an interesting additive to the person that wanted to get on that committee. Okay. Um, okay. So the ones that I just went through are the changes that we want to go with tonight. 
Yeah. Yeah. Agreeable, yeah. Sounds good. Okay. So I have a motion or do you want to? A motion to appoint those. Okay, I move, I move to appoint the members that we discussed. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. <coughs> Okay, item eight is public business. Is there anything under public okay, business? Uh, just given the uh, nature of today's meeting, there are a few things that uh, we're going to be leaving for the next meeting. Uh, wanted to be respectful of everyone's time, being that this was government specific focus on appointment of members and appointment of uh, select board membership committees. So this report will be brief. Uh, I want to start out with just a topic that had been initially brought up, which was the uh, manganese issue. We continue to work with um, uh, Agency of Natural Resources, with the Department of Environmental Conservation, and also with the Drinking Water or Groundwater Protection District. Um, we have asked on three separate occasions uh, from the Drinking Water Groundwater Protection District Director to answer some questions as to the very specific nuances of secondary standards and primary standards. So what I have been able to confirm from Drinking Water and from DEC specifically is that the state of Vermont has adopted secondary standards for manganese according to US EPA. And those secondary standards require that towns um, test for manganese with the ultimate user, which is the very last user in the water system. What the state of Vermont is doing, what DEC requires, is that everyone test for water at the entry point. So with that one particular instance, I've specifically asked them, I said, well, if the state has adopted secondary standards for manganese as written by US EPA, why are we then creating our own standards and then also specifically creating a health standard as opposed to what UCPA says manganese is, which is a secondary standard which should only be considered for aesthetic purposes, color and odor. And there is a, there is a word in there that DEC is, is clinging to, which is um, that states are allowed to, to consider wellness. Um, and in wellness we include health, we include prosperity, we include any number of different things. Uh, what the state is specifically saying is that we're only focusing on the health component of it. So what they're doing is they're creating in-state a primary standard for US EPA, for manganese, but using US EPA secondary standards. And so they're essentially mixing apples and oranges and saying that we are allowed in the state to change regulations, to monitor specifically for health and not just for color and odor. Where, whereas I'm saying to them, well, uh, chapter 3 of the Vermont State Code, Section 800, says we are not allowed to do that. The state has to either amend water quality rules or specifically create an own rule, but they can't use an existing stipulation in a rule and then incorporate new practices or procedures um, as opposed to creating an own rule for this one issue. Um, so with the questions that I pose specifically to the drinking water and uh, drinking water folks and to uh, ANR and DEC, they're just refusing to answer the question. On three separate occasions, I've included our state representatives in their email messages and they've just not responded. So we're continuing to, to, to prod and we're continuing to ask questions uh, and I'm hoping to at the very least get someone from the environmental portion of the administration, DEC, ANR, or drinking water to actually give us a response to our very specific nuanced questions. The next issues are specifically about consolidating services. So the town has been working uh, very, very, has been specifically focused on consolidating services so that we could have a much greater bargaining position when it comes to helping on contracts or essentially um, placing the town in a better bargaining position in general so we could have a uh, a more fair contract or, or price for our services. 
We had found that over a number of years, we had a mixture of telephone lines with Fairpoint, a mixture of uh, <coughs> telephone lines with Comcast, internet services with both. Um, after consolidating services, we had found that we we're going to save approximately about $5,500 to um, $6,000 per year just on consolidating under Comcast. Uh, we have been assured that the service will not diminish. We have been assured that there are protections with Comcast service because we had some issues, I believe, in the past with the uh, previous hurricanes about loss of, of service with electricity. The buildings that we will require uh, continued service if there was interruption due to a natural um, disaster of some kind, we do have generators in those buildings, so we will have the ability to use our Comcast telephone lines. Um, just want to point out that this was something that Larry kind of pointed out at one point, so he kind of led us in the direction of the telephone service, and so I just wanted to say thanks for pointing that out to us. Um, we are still working on being able to have a representative of Smith Barney to come in to brief the board on the town's um, current position with um, taxpayer positions and, and savings. Uh, the plan was to have a representative come in this month for a briefing, but because we moved the meeting from the traditional day, which is the second Thursday of the month, to today, uh, we were not able to have that person as that person was traveling back to Vermont tomorrow morning. So the idea is to have this person back uh, in town hall here to brief the board on what positions we have with the town's money uh, and whether they are risky or they're conservative and what we can do to better maintain the taxpayers' uh, money. Uh, I have been meeting with uh, community groups on a regular basis, uh, most recently with RACDC to discuss the downtown designation program with a, a new iteration of a group in, in East Randolph uh, that's now referring to themselves as the East Valley Community. And they are, they're, they, they're essentially calling themselves East, Randolph, uh, East Valley because they're comprised of residents in South Randolph, East South Randolph, East Randolph, and North East Randolph is how they're describing themselves. So uh, I've been meeting with them to talk about any number of issues about how we can increase recreation to East Randolph, how we can provide greater services. Um, they have specifically asked um, me on something that I had shared with the board before about an interest of having select board meetings in East Randolph once we were able to have the East Randolph Hall uh, rehabilitated and opened again for service. Um, I was happy that they suggested that because that was something that I was already thinking about. Um, I'm not sure how the board feels about that yet, but... Uh, I think it's great. Yeah, right. <laughs> I think it's my turn to have a short I think it's a good idea. <laughs> you signed up with them here. <laughs> so the, the loose plan that I hope to present at some point to the board is how to be able to have leapfrog meetings, one in the village, one in Randolph Center, and one in East Randolph, uh, alternating every other month so that the community at the very least feels like um, they have a direct immediate connection to the board as opposed to having to come down to the village. Um, the folks in East Randolph, when they shared their idea and I said, you know, that's something we can work toward. I didn't commit the board to doing that, but I said that's something that we could certainly share with the board and work, work with the community on. Um, they were happy to hear about that. So uh, We are still taking, or at the very least, trying to collect as many um, estimates for repairs for East Randolph as possible, uh, for the East Randolph Hall. Uh, at the moment, we have cost estimates for repair to bathrooms and uh, ADA accessibility to the building, upwards of about forty to fifty thousand dollars. We do have that money put aside in the capital budget. Uh, we also have money put aside in the capital budget for paintings and other issues that exist with the hall. Uh, but what I'm working with the group is to figure out exactly where we are with the hall, try to provide cost estimates of what it would cost to rehabilitate the old hall versus what it would cost for other options. Um, the group is very open to hearing whatever options exist, whatever options would be less expensive to the taxpayer of the town. So if one option comes in at less money than rehabilitating the old building, they're willing to hear about it. But one of the things they did ask is that at our next meeting, which is being held on the 12th next week, they asked that I bring in a few, at the very least a few cost estimates for repairs and also uh, to share with them an update of what work, work, work we have done with contractors uh, to see what we can do about getting that hall open. So, a uh, conversation for that is going to continue. Uh, we have, uh, by we I mean the town, we have obtained um, some data from Werva with regard to their response times uh, at various points of the town. 
Um, I don't have the specific numbers, but the numbers that I do have indicated that in East Randolph, they do have response time, the response times uh, upwards of 30 minutes and above, uh, depending on, on the call. Uh, in Randolph Center, they have calls ranging upwards of 30 minutes for a response time. And also in the village, there are response times ranging anywhere from zero minutes to 20 minutes. Um, I wasn't comfortable with the data that was presented to the town. It, it was really just, this is the data that we processed, here it is, digested. My response to them was, I like data, I like reviewing it, give me the, the amounts, give me the figures, give me the times. Um, there was some pushback with why they could not provide the data, say, in a spreadsheet or in materials, a material way that I would be able to, to review it, process it, and share it to the board. Um, and I also said that I would like additional review of the data because I, di I, didn't, I didn't like that some of the responses indicated that there's zero response time for calls in the village. And their, through their explanation is that if an ambulance is on Summer Street, when someone on Summer Street calls the ambulance, the ambulance is already there. Uh, and I said I, I did not want to look at those outland those outliers in the data because the idea that that I have is to present the board with the, uh, the amount of response time that it takes from if they're in the bay to come to Randolph Center, to come to the village, or come to East Randolph. If there are these outliers of the ambulance is already there, so it's a zero minute response time, or an outlier of there was a police emergency that forced the ambulance to sit idle for 20 minutes. I said, those are, those are outliers, and I would rather just focus on the ones that are very direct to, to speaking to their response time. So they agreed. They said that they would, at the very least, rerun their data with these parameters, uh, and they felt comfortable rerunning their data with these parameters. So I hope to have, I hope to have that information for the next meeting. Uh, we are also moving forward with replacing the previous uh, secretary position with a special projects coordinator slash grants administrator. Um, we felt that it was a greater need to the town to have this position serving the town residents as opposed to someone on staff who's specifically focused on uh, the administrative tasks. So the idea is to, we have a, a draft um, uh, position announcement that we've created. We still have to go through the very specific portions of reviewing what it, exactly it is that we would like the position to do, what expertise that we would like for them to have with regard to grants management, grant administrating, and to make sure that we don't have too much overlap with our existing grants person in the finance department. So we want to make sure that the position works well with our existing grants person as opposed to uh, having too much overlap uh, and paying somebody for the same skills that we already have. So we are hoping to move forward with that position very soon. Uh, we don't have uh, an actual timeline, but we're hoping to have that too. Um, with, with respect to the administrative portion of what needs to happen in town hall, the mail, the answering telephones, uh, understanding that staff in town hall already have three or four or five different hats that we have to put on from time to time, uh, I have asked our finance director to explore with some of the cuts that we've already made, uh, but not necessarily cuts, but some of the mainstreaming and the efficiencies that we've created that are uh, already showing us long-term savings on a year basis, on a two-year basis. If we identify enough of these savings, I have asked them to consider uh, proposing a part-time administrative person that could be essentially a floater. They could bounce around from all the different departments to see what needs to be done administratively. Um, Drafting reports, answering telephones, speaking directly with constituents that are reporting pothole damage to their cars or other issues in the community. So we want to make sure that even though we're mainstreaming and even though we've identified that having an administrative person on staff um, is not as important as having a grants administrator or a special projects coordinator, that we don't lose any efficiency or effectiveness with the day-to-day -day administrative uh, work at Town Hall. So as soon as we identify enough savings, what we'll do is we'll come to the board, we'll let me know this is where the savings are, this is what we're proposing, and if the transfer is essentially a revenue neutral or a cost neutral uh, venture, then you know, we'll propose to the board that the board allow us to hire uh, a new staff person at uh, half time. Um, and that is it for, for this one. Wait a minute. Any comments? Hang on, please. 
Any comments from the questions? No. Okay. no. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> In reference to uh, your, your, uh, what you said about uh, approaching the state about water quality and trying to fight that, man, that uh, mandate or requirement, um, I understand your position that you're, you're seeing it in terms of it, um, the, the, from the standpoint of fees and how that may impact the sort of marketability of the town and from a standpoint of economic uh, development and attracting business. I think you kind of framed it that way, like, you know, bringing fees down, like that, maybe that ties in in some way for economic development. But I would just point out that um, regardless of whether, you know, I know there's a debate about uh, manganese and whether it's actually, you know, if some people may say maybe it's not something to worry about from a health standpoint, the EPA says it does. I know there's a debate about that, but I think the thing about that that you need to keep in mind is that um, there's also the perception that if a town's water is not up to an EPA standard, then how is that perceived by somebody who's considering relocating the business to the town? So it's not just about the fees of, of the water service, it's also about water quality. And if you have water quality that has been sort of the state saying, you're not up to snuff, that's not going to reflect well on this town for, for economic development. People are not going to want to move here. And I have a friend who lives in North Bennington where they have a very, very serious PFOA issue. And I've seen what that did. And at the time when they said they, it was all about jobs, it was all about attracting business, they said we don't need to worry about it. They knew what PFOA was. They got about 30 years of uh, good, good business and manufacturing in North Bennington. But now it's a, it's a disaster zone. It's, it's polluted people's wells. There's serious water contamination. There's people have cancer. You know, so, so what does that, how does that now reflect on North Bennington? They have that permanent, you know, sort of stain on their reputation and their ability to attract people to live there or bring business. And I know that manganese is a different issue, but I would just keep that in mind. It's not just about fees. It's about the perception that when people are looking at you know, moving here, and if you want to attract people, that it might be easier to, to do this thing. The other thing, too, is I know that not every select board person or committee member lives in town, so they're not necessarily drinking the water. I live in town, and I've, I've followed the water quality reports over the years. Every year it comes out. Manganese has always been high, and although it wasn't always over a set limit, it was always sort of at the high end of the, of the range. And I called the health department years ago. I said, well, what's the issue? You know, why, is, why is this even a concern? They said, back then, when they weren't even saying it was a health issue, they said, well, one of the things that manganese does is it causes an odor problem. And it, there are times when the water in this town literally smells bad. I mean, I notice, and it fluctuates because the manganese level fluctuates for whatever reason, whatever well it's coming from, whatever. And so, you know, if you have restaurants, you want to attract that kind of thing, do they want to be serving water that smells bad? Then they have to filter it. It's not easy to filter. The only thing that filters manganese is reverse osmosis, and that's very expensive. So I, I would just encourage you guys to consider all these other implications here, and not just water fees when you're, when you're dealing with this. And I think to try to fight it, what is that going to cost? You're going to go to court? You know, it just, to me, it doesn't... I don't think it would make sense. And you know, as a, as a, a paying uh, water customer who's paying a lot of money for crappy, smelly water, I'd rather my water uh, smell good and not have to worry about this. Um, I had one other question, too, and that's um, Adolfo had told, uh, told me that he was working on a letter to the select board to ask for $10,000 back from the Conservation Commission. The Conservation Commission had given towards the uh, preservation land at, at Exit 4. And I'm wondering if that's still in the works So and what's and going on with that. Part of my that. report in the later, not in the later time, but it will be, if it is recommended to the board to do that and the board accepts placing it on the agenda, then it will be an item on the agenda that specifically speaks to that point. For the next meeting? Would that be the next? Well, it was something that... Would that be taken on? I would have to bring that to the board for the board to decide what items it would like to see on the agenda. Well, my understanding was that was going to be talked about tonight. Mm -hmm. That was in that article in the paper, that inflammatory right. article. Right. And I came here specifically to hear your presentation that it tells about. Okay. So 
There's a, there's a number of things here with this. There's a number of issues here, and, and the way this came up, and the way that was it was planned in the press before an election. I was at the select board meeting last year, last June, uh, when it was debated by the Conservation Commission. Uh, Brendan Barden was here on behalf of the commission. He presented it, uh, had unanimous uh, vote of approval by the commission. Then it was voted on by the select board. It was debated thoroughly, and, and I was here as a representative of Exit Forum and Space to speak and to answer to some of the questions that came up when, when it was voted on. And the main thing, and, I'll, and I, I'm here to reiterate this, because the main thing that was a component all the way along through that fundraising process was that there would be public access on those 22 acres of land. That was clear, and, and that's still clear. That's still a component of, of that land. The other thing about that is the land behind the driving range, which is owned by Miles Hooper, that's the field behind the driving range. That's part of the 150 acres that's also preserved. When the Vermont Land Trust wrote the, wrote the uh, restrictions and the easements on that land, they wrote in a path. It's part of it. It's written into that, into that site plan that there will be public access, a pathway on that land. The only access to that, to get to that path that the Vermont Land Trust put in, is the pathway that was guaranteed in this 22 acres. So if you guys want to like stir this up and like try to ask the money back, this is very divisive and I think it's gonna be a big mistake because there's a lot of people that want that access. It's how it was sold to the public. It's why people, one reason why people donated. And there are many different parties in this town that want to see that happen. I know that Rasta, the, the trail network, they want to see that access and that's, and we've discussed it with them. They would like to see that. They, they have a bigger picture of, taking not just having the access on the 22 acres but going back into miles land on the behind it and then back into Volga Road they've spoke to other budding landowners who want to see that happen there it's ties into a whole bigger picture of they're trying to do a bigger trail network all around town you, you, you know, spoke to that the, the recreation portion was sold to the town can you speak as to who sold that portion like I just I just want okay. to get specifics there was a fundraiser that went on last summer, okay? Madam Chair, I have to go back to work after this. Can we save this for the next meeting when it's on the agenda? Uh, well, look, this was in the press. Yeah, and we yeah, have very small statements. It's not on the agenda. You got a question. Okay, well, the, the, thing here, the thing here is there's a lot of the double standards, and I'll just say, that the I'll just this will be my final comment. Well, well, wait, One a minute, thing, wait a minute, before you say, your, before you say this is your final comment, um, I know this isn't on the agenda, but it was in the press, and it's an issue that we're not asking for action on, so it doesn't need to be on the agenda. But there are people that have sat here for three hours waiting to have their say on whatever this was that was going to be discussed. So while it's not on the agenda, there's no reason why this discussion can't continue. I mean, you have a thing on your agenda that says other business. Why isn't this other business? Other right. business is what? A catch-all for whatever you forgot to put on the agenda, and so you do it as other business? I understand what you're saying. It will be on the agenda at some point. Well, and so... Oh, just information. How do things get on the agenda? How do things get on the agenda? Well, from we, now on... Said they, said they, we don't need to worry about that. The combination of town business that has to be dealt with, of requests from the public for things to go on. Usually a topic like this could be heard under um, things not on the agenda and then if it needs to be a bigger time it goes out so everybody can participate in the conversation well, so it's and it's awkward with the timing of the news article then. yeah exactly with all due respect you know I could have said all this at the beginning but I knew the guy from BCRD was trying to get out of here and get back to, to Montpelier as well I, I don't know <clears throat> Yeah, let, let, let me just jump in for a minute. Let me, let me say something about the manganese. I am, I am very impressed, Adolfo, with your level of analysis and what you've gone through to look at um, you know, the, the rules and laws and everything else. Um, it's very impressive. Thank you. And, and I mean that absolutely sincerely. I've been practicing environmental law for 25 years dealing with ANR. 
And over that time, there has been, there, there is now a situation where we have uh, an agency that is trying to expand its jurisdiction and authority, basically. And to try to go to them, as you have, you are doing nothing but beating your head against the wall, trying to convince them not to enforce their laws. At least that's the way they look at it. Okay, they have standards, and you are not going as a non-scientist to convince them of anything. We could hire an expert <laughs> scientist, and they're not going to convince a and R of anything. And so I am very impressed with your energy about this, and the LED dynamics issue is very concerning, though I have no <clears throat> clue why somebody, whoever this person is, is saying you can't apply for Act 250 because of this issue that it, Chris Brecky and I talked about that after town meeting and we're scratching our head going, I'm not sure who's telling him that, but that sounds crazy. I spoke to Chris right here this morning, so maybe you may want to yeah, speak so, with him again. And, and you know what? And we as town people are very concerned about LED. I, as a school board member, am very concerned because we have an incredible relationship with GW Plastics and LED and internships and opportunities for our kids. Mm -hmm. right, but we all support that, but yeah. can we get back to the agenda item? So, so, well, this is in response to what he was talking about in the, in the town report, in the manager's report. There are other avenues to approach the issue about LED and the manganese and the ANR, and it ain't knocking on ANR's door and talking to these low-level people or mid-level people. It's going to Phil Scott. Phil Scott is the governor of the state who is committed to business who wants balance and wants to control environmental regulations and permitting so that it makes common sense. And that's why he's against big win, okay? That's who we need to go to to fix this problem. We need an audience with the governor because the governor is in charge of enforcement of our laws. He controls a and R. I, it's just, I'm troubled that you are expending so much energy on this when I went, and you were talking about litigation at one point, and it's like, no, no, there is, I'm, there's never an I'm sure we're going to win. And you're gonna, we're gonna spend tons and tons of money, much, much money that we don't have to spend and likely not accomplish the goal that you're seeking, even though it makes perfect sense, it's logical. We're talking about government regulations, federal and state, and interaction of those things. Can I jump in for a minute? Yeah. We've already had a conversation with the governor about this, kind of off the record, so he is aware of the situation. So that came up in a meeting that we had in January, okay. and I think we're trying to work through that. I think he's understanding where we're at. But I think Adolfo's efforts at this point, we're not talking about the town spending a lot of money fighting this. There is this, and, and I do have a little background in water because I manage the water system, okay? And so the difference here is, is what the federal standard is and what the state standard is. Mm -hmm. And you have more manganese in a bottle of water that you buy at the store than you currently have in the town water system. So the regulations are a little skewed here, so we best ask the governor to look into this. I think, you know, maybe in a little while we'll have some form of resolution to this. The LED problem, I agree with you. Don't know where it came from. It seems <coughs> counterproductive to what we're trying to do here. And, and I don't mean to, you know, drag this on and on. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, my concern was so much effort and energy is going into this process of trying to talk to a brick wall that... We get it. <laughs> and, and so approaching the governor is great, but having the solution ready and available so that they can be given a solution is the best way to accomplish reaching goals when it comes to, you know, it's great to say, yeah, Phil's looking into it, but. I agree, and yeah. that's, that's where they left it with us, and just, you know, so I'm, I'm waiting to hear something back, okay. and I'm hoping it'll be positive, but, you know, you know how it works up there. Sure. Um, and just, <laughs> very quickly on the other issue. Um, you know, for being a person in this town and reading accusations in the Valley News um, by, by someone who, you know, I think you're doing an admirable job, but you weren't here at the time that these activities happened in terms of the Conservation Commission, the Select Board, etc. And for you as a representative of this town to go to the press and to say, um, you know, somebody was hoodwinked and the select board was misrepresented to by this organization that they've never talked to. For the record, you're paraphrasing. Just want to make sure, because these are being recorded and 
will be online. Okay, you, can read, you can read what the Valley News says, and if sort of you know, misled, I'm trying to misled. give a, okay, misled, misrepresentation, whatever word you want to use. But that means to me that the select board was given information that was false. Okay, when I read that in the paper, and so I see that, and I'm like, so I went to the to the minutes. I'm like, what do you mean they didn't talk about? Evaluation. They didn't know what the consequences are going to be. A, they're the taxing authority. How can they be misled about what the taxes are going to be when land is conserved? Do they not know that if you're stripping off development rights and the value of the land is what it should be, which is agricultural, because that's all you can use it for, they don't understand that it would be reassessed? That's kind of embarrassing um, for... Randolph to be portrayed in the sense that select board is either ignorant or incompetent and doesn't know their own business. I was shocked by that. But in addition to that, to suggest that um, in my subsequent conversation um, about, I went to the town manager and I said, who made the representation and what did they say? And I was unable to find out who it was that made a, made a whatever the word is, miss. Not misled, misled. misled, whoever misled the select board. Who is it that misled the select board? And what did they say that misled the select board? And what position did they have that had anything to do with preservation trust? Um, they are not negotiating a deal with the select board. They're not making an offer or a demand and going back and forth about, well, we'll do this if you do that. So I truly do not understand how our town manager was authorized to do this because he wasn't here and how could he know that the select board was misled if he wasn't here and in fact land valuation was part of the discussion before the select board and it's in your own minutes. Thank you. Um, I have two comments. One of one Are they relevant to what we're talking about? They're relevant to the town manager's report. One of them and is about the water, the manganese. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to ask this at town meeting, but I was too shy. Um, so uh, my question is, I think we need to know, it's going to be brief, we need to know the exact cost of, a fil of what it would cost to replace the filtration system, and we need to know the cost of what it's going to take to litigate and for you to try to sue the state, and we need to balance which is going to be cheaper, and we also need to know what is Bill McGrath waiting on for LED Dynamics? Is he waiting on the town to say, we're going to fix the system, and as soon as we say that, can he go ahead with his project? Because I think that that should determine where what we should do moving forward. Um, so that's my question. That's my statement for that. Um, and regarding the um, exit four issue, you did say in the press that at the next select board meeting you were going to present a letter. So I just think that that's bad form to say in the press you're going to do something and then not do it. Right. Um, so I just want to throw that out there. Sure. Great. <clears throat> Very quickly, I can get a, a meeting with Jason Gibbs regarding the manganese thing if you'd like to do that. Maybe the two of you would be willing to come to the state house and we can figure it out. Unless the board wanted to, I'm, I'm not representing anything to do with the town. I'm happy in any way, as I've always let folks know in the town, I'm happy to help in any way I can. But I don't think it's appropriate for me to go anywhere unless the board were to authorize me to do so if this was an issue about speaking on behalf of the town. Sure. In terms of me as an individual person, I'm not even in the water district. <laughs> I'm, not even, I'm not affected by it. So I wouldn't even be an appropriate person to go on behalf of the water district, really. It's who you should be having. Right. But, but again, if there's anything I can do to help, I'm more yeah. than happy to. Well, give, give to, he's privy to the to the conflict and the prospect of litigation, so I figured maybe I would be willing to use whatever sort of capital I might have. But just keep in mind that before, even before the they, the EPA came up with this new lower standard. The water smells bad, and there are days when it smells bad. So even even if this happens, you know, it's going to happen. So it's still a consideration. Maybe I can get you to come too. Sure. Okay. Cool. 
Is something that hasn't been said yet? Yeah, it's two sentences. It has okay. nothing to do with any of this. Um, <laughs> Perfect. Oh. I think it would be great to have select board meetings in East Randolph. I just want to make sure that in addition to bathrooms and accessibility and everything else, the building that we have select board meetings in has internet access because I think that's a utility nowadays, not just a nice add-on, and it is one of the things I'm concerned about with what? East Randolph, although I would love to have meetings over there. I think that makes sense. Yeah. I believe as part of his uh, report earlier about the Comcast being townwide services, the fire department next door will get it. So I oh, think it's going in there as well. That sounds great. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. One, one quick statement about Paul Brune. I just think that it's really bad form if our town is attacking someone who has come to many towns in Vermont and done help preserving historic, lots and lots of historic places. He is the most kind, compassionate, but conscientious person that I've ever known. He is full of integrity. He has been so wonderful to work with over the last three years. And maybe you all have a different viewpoint of him, but I think it would be really scandalous and improper. <laughs> and really bad form for our town to do anything that diminishes what he's done for us, not just this time with Exit 4, but for anything that he's helped us with, which has been a lot over the years. So. And I would just add, and I'm sorry I've talked so much tonight, <laughs> but I think that an apology needs to be written to Paul Brune yeah. and yeah. the Preservation yeah. Trust of Vermont yeah. to apologize for slandering them in the press, yes. okay? Mm -hmm. Miss Preservation Trust misled select board is not a true statement. They never came, they never talked to you, they ne never led you at all, no less misled you. Mm -hmm. People that came who were part of Exit 4, the, the group, Exit 4 Open Space, that fought Mr. Samus on his Act 250 situation, they came as townspeople to try to give you information and to, as townspeople, support, tell you we want you to support this Conservation Commission is doing it. So there's some suggestion, well, somebody with Exit 4, maybe they were sort of representing Preservation Trust. No, that's, that's baloney, okay? I would like to ask the board to issue an apology to Mr. Broom and Preservation Trust. Yes. And I was yeah. at I was yeah. at that meeting. We're done with this topic. Thank you. Wait a minute. Wait. We we've, we've gone way over and beyond on the topic. We get the message. We'll respond. And we'll take it. We've got it. No, I mean respond. This topic is scheduled for another visit. Which so visit we're not is it done. scheduled for? Well, when it if it comes up that. Yeah. We're going to take some type of action. It'll be on the board agenda. That's not a good idea. That's not a good idea to put it on the agenda. We have not to take a good action. idea to put off responding to this issue. So can I just say something about this? Mm -hmm. So seeing how I'm a new member here, okay, I'd like to do a little digging and a little research into this subject myself before I make any decision to vote on anything to deal with this issue right now, okay? Because I'm not privy to the same information that maybe all of you had, okay? So I'd like a little time to think about it and review it. So that's what I'd like to do. I wish you'd well, done that, that before you went to the state house, Perry. It had not, so, so we're not gonna get into a conversation about that because that is not how this happened and you are very misinformed if you think it did. Okay, my conversation with Paul Brune had nothing to do with the exit for open space situation or any other situation like that. So if you think that's what happened, you're, you're misunderstood about how that occurred. We talked about some other things and had nothing to do with this. So I don't know where you got your information from, but I can tell you that got that was Paul not Brune. the case. Pardon? Got it from Paul Brune. Well, Paul Brune, okay, and I had a very candid conversation, okay, for two minutes out of 15 minutes, okay. The first 15 minutes were quite cordial. So this is not where it came from. So whatever Paul told you, okay, maybe he owes me an apology at this point because I've been put on the hot seat here for something that I had nothing to do with. Okay. I'm so sorry. That, we're going to move for a motion to go into executive session to discuss a labor contract and an attorney communication. Do you want to make the motion? So moved. Second. 
second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.